Greater Fort Walton Beach Chamber of Commerce, Eglin Federal Credit Union, the Boeing Company, and Northwest Florida State College welcome you to the 75th anniversary of the United States Air Force Community Celebration. Please stand now for the presenting of colors by Eglin Color Guard and remain standing for our national anthem as presented by Herbert Field Airman First Class Ayanna Dickerson and our invocation from Herbert Field Chaplain Major Joshua Rumsey. Eglin Color Guard, please present the colors. Am I? I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we gather today to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United States Air Force. We are grateful for the countless lives of American warriors the Air Force has saved. We recognize the impact this organization has delivered for our nation, our community, and countless lives of Air Force members. Remind us this impact extends beyond our nation. We ask you guide airmen as we use the unique capabilities and capacity as a force for good. Remind us that last year the Air Force removed 82,000 people in Afghanistan from living under oppression. Echoed back to the 110,000 evacuated during the last days of the Vietnam conflict. And that recalled back to the Berlin airlift. May our next efforts rescue even more. May our combat forces strike evil with precision and fury. And may our lives be lived upholding the values of integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. We ask these things in your most holy of all names. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Eglin Color Guard, Airman First Class Dickerson, and of course, Chaplain Rumsey for starting us off today. Well done. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Ted Corcoran, President of the Greater Fort Walton Beach Chamber of Commerce, and I'll be your host for today's event. On April 18, 2022, right here on this exact stage, our community came together and held the amazing honor to host the final goblet ceremony for the Doolittle Raiders. While planning that event, it was decided that we would choose one local veteran to represent each of the 16 Raider crews. 
To help on the selection process, we worked with our public affairs friends from Herbert Nagel and had some incredible assistance from Dennis Barnett at the Air Commando Association. In the process of gathering those folks, I was introduced to some really cool folks, like Colonel Larry Robka and Chief Master Sergeant Bill Walters, both of who we're gonna hear from today. What we decided to do is it was time to tell the story about military operations based here at Herbert and Eglin that were just amazing. I hadn't heard any of them. I thought, this is amazing. I wonder if everyone out there in the community knows about them. And as a result, we determined that today's theme was gonna be the story behind the story as told by those who were there. This would be the best way for our Chamber of Commerce to not only educate our community on how amazing our Air Force family is, but a great way to tell our Air Force friends how much we appreciate what they do. And that's our goal today, is to a little education on the history here in our area. The agenda is located in your program. Hope you'll follow along as an amazing timeline of happenings in our community since 1933. Now, please note, we're not gonna be able to include everything that happened on those three pages of Chronological. We've picked a couple of the, couple of the ones that we could do, and if, if you like it, we'll come back again and do some more in a couple of months. So we're very excited about that. I'm so, speaking of excited, I'll never forget when Representative Pat Maney about a year ago said, hey, I met this really cool guy in an event, and he said he'd come up and do an event with us if you'd like to. I said, oh my gosh, would I like to? So we're so honored, my friends, today my co-host is actor, technical advisor, radio personality, and writer, Captain Dale Dye, a decorated Marine veteran of the Vietnam War. He is the founder and head of Warriors Inc., a technical advisory committee company specializing in portraying realistic military action in Hollywood films. He is the author of 12 books, including a recent release about the Korean War titled Korean Odyssey, a novel of Marine Rifle Company in the Forgotten War. It's exciting so far, isn't it? It is, it is, and, and happy anniversary, uh, Air Force, and, uh, and uh, the Eglin community that uh, supports it. Um, I'll take just a moment uh, with your indulgence. Absolutely, here, my friend. Uh, I kind of feel like a PFC in the Pentagon here with uh, all of these aviation guys all over me. As a knuckle-dragging infantryman, it's a little tough on me to relate sometimes. Uh, but I, it's something I haven't mentioned before to audiences, but uh, I, I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, I remember back in 1963 when I enlisted, that recruiter in Cape Girardeau, Missouri said, yeah, you can be a pilot, sure. Yeah, sign right here. <laughs> so I did, and uh, about six months later, I find myself at Camp Pendleton, standing waist deep in a hole with another guy filling sandbags. And I said, you know, something's wrong here, because they said I could be a pilot. He said, you are. I said, what? He said, yeah, I'm a pilot. And he picked up a sandbag, and he said, I pilot here, <laughs> I pilot there. And I pilot over here, and that was the total of my aviation experience. Anyway, it's a delight to be with you, and you hear more from me a little later. Yes, we're honored to have Captain Dale Dye here. In the planning of this event, I would say Dale Dye is coming, and people would either immediately know him from lots of cool movies, or they'd say, yeah, who is he again? So just for those in the audience saying, I recognize him, I see his picture again, let's show a little Dale Dye video to kind of catch you up where you may have seen Dale Dye previously. On that BAR, stand by. I'm a retired captain. Fire! I uh, fought in uh, Southeast Asia and in the Middle East. I felt that uh, much of the movies that were being done about the military, about the American fighting man, were nonsense. So I came to Hollywood full of bright and shining promises and ideas about how I could fix all of this. I believe that there's a certain heart and a certain spirit that's common throughout fighting men. And I think that actors who are like dry sponges until you pour on the water and the liquid and that sort of thing need to be immersed in the rigorous lifestyle, in the horrors that infantrymen and combat people all over the world face. And so to the extent that insurance and lifestyles will allow, I immerse those actors in that lifestyle. I ought to have you all shot. There's nothing less than an act of mutiny while we prepare for the goddamn invasion of Europe. All of you NCOs have disgraced the 101st Airborne. You can consider yourself lucky that we are on the eve of the largest action in the history of warfare, which leaves me no choice but to spare your lives. Now get out of my office and get out of my sight. Get. You have to understand, we're essentially playing guys who are tired and miserable and uh, who'd, want, who'd want to go home. 
um, of whom great physical things are being demanded of constantly. And, and we couldn't have done that without having gone through something like Dale Dye put us through. Now, God damn it, not now. We'll get into this when we get back to the base camp. And I can promise you something. If I find out there was an illegal killing, there will be a court-martial. Right now, I need every man in the field. And you two will cease fire. Mac, there is no way you can know where in the hell he was dropped. General, first reports out of Ike's people at Shape said the 101st is scattered all to hell and gone. There's misdrops all over Normandy. Now, assuming Private Ryan even survived the jump, he could be anywhere. In fact, he's probably KIA. And frankly, sir, we go sending some sort of rescue mission, flatheading throughout swarms of German reinforcements all along our axis of advance, and they're going to be KIA, too. Is, is, is anyone in that audience not seen Band of Brothers, Saving Private Ryan, etc.? So we're so honored, Dale, to have you here with us today and uh, sharing some interludes as we go through the program here today. Anything exciting you'd like to say before I give a little history, not only to you, but the others about the history oh, of Oh, I've been a, about as exciting as I get right there. So, uh... <laughs> All right, then. Well, let me start off then with a little background history. Eglin Air Force Base originally fell under the command of the U.S. Army Air Corps until President Harry Truman signed the National Security Act of 1947. The United States Air Force was formally established on September 18, 1947. Shortly thereafter, Eglin became the principal United States Air Force Base for development and test of conventional bombs, missiles, and weapon systems. Eglin encompasses over 130,000 square miles and spans over three counties. Today, a joint community of military service branches share space on Eglin Air Force Base, such as special operations and training, including the Naval Explosive Ordnance Disposable School and U.S. Army 7 Special Forces Group. Today, the Greater Fort Wall Beach area is, world area is a world-class community of military training, special operations, weapons development and testing, and of course, higher education, which brings me to my first introduction. I'm very honored to come right over there, the host for today's event, the president of Northwest Florida State College, the one and only Dr. Devin Stevenson. Dr. Stevenson. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to Northwest Florida State College. We would like to thank uh, Ted, you and the Greater Fort Walton Beach Chamber of Commerce for allowing us to be an integral part of this historic moment. We are honored to be hosting today's event as we commemorate the Air Force's 75th anniversary and celebrate the incredible men and women who have dedicated their lives to protecting our nation. At Northwest Florida State College, we value our military community and recognize the sacrifices that our service members have made. For those of you who don't know, in the college's first year of operation in 1964, Okaloosa Walton Junior College, as it was then known, set about to choose a school mascot. It was decided that the college use the name Raiders in honor of the heroic airmen who trained at Eglin Air Force Base for their famous World War II raid on Tokyo. Northwest Florida State College is indeed proud to use the name Raiders to pay tribute to the heroes of the past who have shaped our future today. We look forward to celebrating the past, the present, and the future as we hear from some very distinguished guests and learn of more legacies and traditions that have helped shape our great nation. To those who have served and those who continue to serve, I speak for the entire college community when I say thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice, for your bravery, and the example that you have set for us all. We owe you our deepest gratitude, but more importantly, we owe you our freedom. Our country would not be the same 
without your courage and sacrifice. God bless you all. Well done, Dr. Stevenson. We're so honored to have the event here. We want to thank Jeanette and Chris and all of the staff that have helped us in this great event and this beautiful facility. Speaking of beautiful, we're so honored in our community to have, to have a gentleman who's a general and a judge, and now, as you know, a representative from uh, representing our area in Tallahassee, the one and only Representative Pat Maney. <laughs> the beautiful Pat Maney, in my opinion. I have to confess, that's the first time I've ever been called beautiful. <laughs> and I'm not even in the Navy. Before I, before I say a few brief things, let me say to all of you who have deployed in the recent conflict, the ongoing conflicts, previous conflicts, on behalf of the Florida House of Representatives and Speaker Chris Sprouse, particularly to the Vietnam veterans, welcome home to the free state of Florida now, some of you may wonder why an army guy is up here. Some of you may wonder why I spell Pat with two T's. Some of you may wonder, what's he have to do with Eglin? And so I thought I'd clear that up for you for just a few seconds. Um, when I was born, in the tradition of the South, my parents gave me a first name and a middle name that carry on family history. Now, what's that have to do with Eglin? Well, my middle name is not Pat, it's Patterson, which is spelled with two T's. First Lieutenant Robert, uh, Robert Patterson Steele was my mother's brother he trained at the Eglin Gunnery Range. And on October 18th, 1943, October 8th, 1943, he was killed at Anzio. So in order to keep his name alive, I was named Patterson. As my nieces and nephews would say, my whole big name is Thomas Patterson. Thomas was my father's middle name, and it became my first name. Dad joined the Army Air Corps. When the Air Force was created, Dad transferred to the Air Force. He retired from the Air Force and, and became a civilian here at Eglin. And then in 1976, my wife and I moved to Florida, to Fort Walton Beach where my father was working at Eglin. Along the way, I got appointed to the Florida Defense Support Task Force and had the opportunity to visit every military installation in the state. And I was impressed even more that Eglin Air Force Base is not only a jewel in Okaloosa's crown, but it's vital to the defense of this country and economically, it's vital to the defense and growth of the state of Florida, Okaloosa County, and really the entire picture of why we have a military. So this event really is a welcoming and a recognition of the many ways the United States Air Force has served this community and our nation for 75 years. And I want to recognize General Chuck Horner down here on the first row. He's probably the, the highest ranking person here. Uh, he's former, he is a fighter pilot. He, he doesn't say former fighter pilot. He is a fighter pilot. And as most of you know, he was the commander of the Allied Air Operations in Operation Desert Storm. We have Dr. Richard Hallion, who's down here. 
He's uh, a friend of mine and like General Horner, and he's retired as the historian for the United States Air Force out at Bowling Air Force Base in Washington. We have General Jim Slife. He is the ranking active duty officer here today, I believe, and we are so honored to have him present. I really wish I could take the time to interview all of our, or interview and recognize all of our distinguished guests. But I was told I had three minutes, not a judicial three minutes, not a general's three minutes, but three minutes. So I want to thank each of you for being here, and I'd like to call to the podium and recognize another very distinguished guest that we have today, the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, SEAC, Ramon Colon Lopez. And I think he's going to give us a few brief words, briefer than mine, about why this is important. So this definitely got started on the right foot, starting with Navy jokes, uh, NCOs disgracing things, right, Captain uh, Die? But we disgrace things, but we make them better. And uh, now with uh, an NCO two minutes, which actually amounts to 30 seconds, so I'll make it brief. Um, it is really an honor to be here. And my journey started in December of 1990. And I was just another average American looking for an opportunity to go ahead and serve a nation and I got more than what I bargained for. There are a lot of concerns right now about generational commitments to supporting what every single generation represented here today is willing to do in the future. Do not worry. America is gonna to continue to produce sons and daughters that are gonna answer the call. We have done it for 75 years and we will not waver in that commitment. Not everything is painted the way that it is, and I will tell you right now, there are a lot of motivated people probably in this very campus and maybe even in the fast food restaurant right down the road, but they will rise up to the occasion. So I would like to take an opportunity to go ahead and thank everyone, past, present, and future, for your commitment, your service, and your loyalty to this great service of ours, the United States Air Force. Not only them, but every civilian Every contractor, guardsman, reservist, retiree that continues to carry the proud badge of the best Air Force in the globe. Thank you, and we look forward for this great event. Thank you, Representative Manny and Senior Enlisted Advisor Colin Lopez. Thank you very kindly. Nice to have you in town. Before we begin the rest of the program, it's very important as we give us a history here, is to recognize some notable local area veterans who not only made historic contributions to national defense, but once called Northwest Florida home. I know I will miss some, so please be fair with me. I'll just give you a couple that I had a chance to know during their tenure here. Starting off with the late Lieutenant General Leroy Manor, who was Air Commander of Sante Raid. Late Colonel Bull S Simons, Ground Commander of Sante Raid. Late Major Dick Meadows, Sante Raid, Operation Eagle Claw. Late Brigadier General Bud Day, Misty Ford Air Controller, Vietnam Prisoner of War, Medal of Honor recipient. The late Michael J. Novosel, sir, you know, he served the United States military during World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. And in order to serve in the Vietnam War, he gave up the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the Air Force Reserve and became a Chief Warrant Officer in the Army. He was awarded the Medal of Honor. Late Brigadier General Harry Heine Alderholt, Air Commando, his wife Ann has joined us today. Ann is right there. Ann, it's delightful to have you here, my friend. Thank you for coming. Very exciting. Very exciting. The late Chief Master Sergeant Joel Talley, Air Force Cross recipient, former Director of Air Force Enlisted Village, and the late uh, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, number nine, James Binnaker, former Director of the Air Force Enlisted Village. So those are folks who lived amongst us and were just did such a great job. They were wonderful people. So thank you for that. All right, so our theme today is the story behind the story, whereas panelists who either witnessed or participated in historical events spanning from World War II to Operation Enduring Freedom are willing to share their unique stories with us today. So I'm going to introduce our first panel, if they'll be lined up there. The very first one 
is our good friend Cindy Cole Shall, who is the daughter of the late Colonel Dick Cole, who served as Colonel Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot in the B-25 in the April of 1942 April raid on Tokyo. Honored to have Cindy come back with us. Colonel Howard Hill, Vietnam veteran F-4 fighter pilot and former POW. Larry Ropka is a Vietnam veteran who led a small group of intelligence and operation officers for Operation Kingpin, the raid on Sante Prison to rescue American POWs. Colonel Ropka was inducted into the Air Commando Hall of Fame in 1969. And Colonel Bill Keeler is a career combat experienced Air Force pilot who was chosen as the commander of the Eglin Refugee Reception Center in 1975 and whose amazing success awarded Colonel Keeler a presidential citation for meritorious service later that year, which is really, really something. So we're gonna hear from these gentlemen in just a second. But before I begin with Cindy and the Doolittle Raiders and um, such, we have to start with Pearl Harbor. And we had the opportunity for the very first time when we had our final goblet ceremony on April 18th of this year, I had the first opportunity to meet this incredible guest. And it's an amazing story because most of us here today, we're talking about movies, we have read about Pearl Harbor, we have watched movies about Pearl Harbor, and we've always wondered, what in the world could it have possibly been like on per, at Pearl Harbor? And in this case, my friend, it's an amazing story because Chief Warrant Officer Frank Emond was there. He was at Pearl Harbor. I am now honored to bring our guest from Pensacola, Chief Warrant Officer Frank Emond. Let me tell you his story. In December 1941, Frank was a French horn player in the band of the battleship USS Pennsylvania, the flagship of the Pacific Fleet. The ship was in dry dock at Pearl Harbor on the morning of December 7th. The band was lined up on the stern to play morning colors. At five minutes before eight o'clock, he saw a line of planes approach the harbor. He watched as the first bomb was dropped on Ford Island. One of the planes began firing directly at the band and Frank could hear the metal clips hit the turret behind him. After running to their battle stations, he felt the ship shudder as they were hit by bomb and caught fire. Frank served as a stretcher barrier carrying casualties to safety and allowing the crew to fight fires. That night he was issued an M1 rifle and he stood guard duty on the dock. He stayed in the Navy and became a band leader retiring in 1968 as Chief Warrant Officer. Today, at 104 years old, he holds the distinction of being the oldest music band conductor according to the Guinness Book of World Records. We're so honored that he could come over and see us today. The one and only Chief Warrant Officer Frank Emon from Pensacola. Frank, thank you very much for coming over here today, sir. Absolutely amazing. So now it's time for our stories behind the stories. And we all know about after Pearl Harbor in March of 1942, here at Eglin Auxiliary Fields 1 and 3 were the training sites for 24 B-25 crews, of which 16 ultimately flew the first strike of World War II against the Japanese mainland. All 80 of the Dual Raiders have passed away. At 103 years old, Cindy's dad, Colonel Dick Cole, a great friend of our community, was the last to rejoin his fellow airmen on April 9th, 2019. And hopefully many of you were here earlier this year. We conducted the Doolittle Raiders final goblet ceremony in this very auditorium. And we are honored to have his daughter, Cindy, with us today. Cindy, will you share some of the stories your dad told us about training here at Eglin Fields? Thank you. Uh, this is uh, a subject that's very dear to my heart. I enjoy talking about this very much. So I might go over town. I hope not. Um, why Eglin Field? Well, it goes back to um, because there was so uh, there wasn't a lot of population down here. It was very large. It was a bombing and gunnery um, grounds, and it gave them a lot. They thought it gave them a lot of privacy, which they needed because they were trying to do a secret mission, um, and. The Doolittle Raid is one of nine special projects that were done during World War II. It was the first one. Um, the men that showed up here were from the 17th Bombardment Group. The Bombardment Group, um, that group was chosen because that was the only plane that General Doolittle thought would take off an aircraft carrier, and it was a, a bomber. And um, so, like Dad said, 
they were going on this whether they volunteered or not because they were the only crews in the world that had the brand new B-25. So uh, it was sort of a toss up. Yes, they were volunteers, but they were sort of locked into it. Um, there were 24 crews that were brought down. Uh, the 17th Bombardment Group came out of um, Pendleton, Oregon. They moved them um, after Pearl Harbor to Lexington, South Carolina because they were staged, they were starting to stage for Operation Torch in November of North Africa, okay? And um, if they hadn't gone on the raid, those crews were all going to North Africa. Um, so they um, came down, they brought 24, even though they thought they could put maybe 16, 17 B-25s on the deck of the Hornet. It was a brand new um, carrier. And they also were leery whether um, these young uh, flyers, some of them only had maybe 200 hours flying, period, because all the co-pilots had come out of the graduation class of um, July of 41, and this was, you know, March of 42. And even the pilots weren't much more seasoned than that. The highest ranking officer, other than General Doolittle, was Major Hilger, and then there were a couple of captains, and the rest were all um, first and second lieutenants and then enlisted uh, personnel. Um, this, this raid was unique because all of the personnel, um, the crew chief, uh, the gunner, the navigator, they were all on the raid. Uh, later on during the war, your crew chiefs usually stayed on the ground. So they had a cross section of everything that made up the Army Air Corps. Um, they got down here the beginning of March of um, 42, hoping to have good weather and um, have basically they were trying to do um, what they needed to do to get off the carrier was to learn how to do carrier uh, takeoff. So they got a lieutenant from um, Pensacola, Lieutenant Miller, to come and teach the crews how to do this. Um, well, the young pilots were very apt, and they really didn't need all that personnel. Um, but not only were they um, doing the flying part, but they used the golf for the navigators because only four of the 24 navigators had celestial navigation, the rest of uh, the navigation techniques they had at that time. Um, eight of the Doolittle Raiders uh, uh, navigators, they came out of Barksdale, which was really the first navigation school of the Army. The Navy had one down in um, uh, Coral Gables, and that's where the four raiders that knew the na uh, celestial navigation learned. Um, and so they used the golf. They also used the, the bombing. Uh, one of the, there was a flight surgeon, um, Harvard graduate, and he went to General Doolittle and he said he wanted to go on the raid. This all happened here. And um, General Doolittle said, um, I'm sorry, but we only have a gunner spot. And I don't remember what the other one was right now, but some minor spot sort of. And so Doc White went to the gunnery range here, and not only did he um, qualify, but he became an expert, <laughs> Harvard Med, <laughs> and it ended up being very um, unique because he was on um, Crew 15, which ended up cr crashing real close to the coast, which was very close to where Ted Lawson's plane crashed, and Ted Lawson was in the ruptured duck and um, they, um, they actually flipped over and quite, they were all injured pretty bad except for uh, Dave Thatcher, um, um, the youngest, one of the youngest on the raid and he helped his whole crew to safety. But um, Doc White, through Chinese, without interpreters, they were able to get to where Lawson was and he was able to doctor Lawson and he stayed behind and Dave Thatcher went with crew 15 to move west against the Japanese. And um, one of the buildings here, we've given uh, a large signed uh, poster by Doc White to one of the buildings. There's actually four buildings here at um, 
this area, Eglin and Hurlburt, that have raiders. Um, one is for um, uh, one is for Ed Horton, who was um, he was a last minute um, sort of pickup on the deck of the ship uh, of the Hornet because he's the only one that had gone to Bindex's school of turrets and the turret they had a lot of trouble with the turrets okay the bottom turret they took out um they left the top one in um these planes if they if it had worked if they'd been able to land they were going to go in the inventory to help china fight um the japanese but that didn't work out so ed ends up being that the last minute and he had been in he'd been in the service he was a little bit older and he didn't want to volunteer but he sort of got he said everybody else raised their hand, so he better raise his hand too, type thing. Um, and then Ed Saylor, another building here at uh, Eglin is named after Ed Saylor. And then there was, like I said, nine special projects in World War II. Uh, out of the nine, only five really existed. I've never found the other four, and I've looked. Um, Dad participated in three of them, uh, the Doolittle Raid, flying the hump and um, the first air commandos. And so dad has a building named after him, um, thanks to Colonel Black. <laughs> uh, so the, the Raiders are, and plus there's Doolittle, um, a couple of roads named after Doolittle and things like that. So they're very well represented around here. Um, Don Smith was able to take off a fully loaded B-25 um, and actually, they were putting more weight in normal because they knew they were going to be carrying extra fuel. They thought, the rumor was that they were going to be put off in an island in the Pacific and, and not to particularly j bomb Japan, but to use that as a staging ground to go uh, because um, they were fighting in the Philippines in the southern part, um, you know, so there was... So, but that's what they thought that was going to happen. They had a couple of ideas, but they weren't sure what was going on. There was only one or two um, of the top. Hilger, probably Greening, and York, and General Doolittle knew exactly what, well, actually that's not true. Uh, Davy Jones and, and Tom Griffin knew because they went to the war buildings in DC to pick up some of the maps, so they knew um, something else was up, but they, they, they weren't sure exactly. So, um, but um, the 24 crews, the 24 planes that came down, um, only 22 actually leave here. They had two known wrecks, and we've heard a third wreck here. And one is actually do uh, documented. It was. Um, Lieutenant Bates, and he was flying it the last day, uh, the 23rd, 22nd of March, and he was the last flight, and um, uh, it actually cracked up real well. Another one uh, flew Joyce, Lieutenant Joyce flew it over to um, um, Houston, and uh, the landing gear or something didn't, and we don't know if that one ever came back into the inventory or not. And then Dave, General Jones said that there was another wreck, but we've never been able to find it. And um, they were told that uh, the, the extra tank, in order to make this trip, they were stripping the plane down as much as, it was already stripped to begin with. It was a Model B, there was only 119 of them made, and they really didn't even finish it out. Dad said it was called what you would call like uh, bought off the shelf. The Army didn't order it. Um, a North American made it, and the Army liked it, and so they went and picked it up, and they started flying it. And it was a very, granted every model they improved on, you know, and it was a very useful, useful um, plane. But um, one of the, the rumors well, some of the statements and rumors were that every, all the planes were um, retrofitted in Minneapolis for the extra bladder, for the extra gas. And um, Greening, Ross Greening, had taken a crew out 
and they were flying over the Gulf, and he called up Larkin, one of the enlisted guys. He was sitting on a, a metal plate that was over where the turret had been taken out. He was sitting on a little toolbox, and um, um, Captain Green called him up to the front for something, and when he got up to go up there, the metal plate and the toolbox fell off into the Gulf, meaning that that plane hadn't had the bladder put in it yet, which it was done down here, okay? Um, but they never really talk about that. So there was quite a bit of work done here in their three weeks that they were here. Um, the um, Raiders, um, 19 of them lost their life in World War II, and uh, about 28 were left in the CBI because of a stop order coming out of uh, a General Barrington coming out of the Philippines, and about 28 of them actually made it uh, back to the States um, with, with orders. A couple of them had orders, but they didn't recognize them, and they ended up staying in the CBI. Five more, five of them lost their life in the CBI, the China India, Bur India Burma Theater. And um, if they hadn't gone on the raid, the ones that came back to the States, they go down to South Carolina and they're back in the group um, and they go to North Africa with the um, Army Air Corps and five more lost their life over there. I did ask Dad, did he feel bad that he was left in China? And he said, no, they were gonna put us back in the war no matter what. Because a lot of people felt they came when they came home. Um, the Doolittle Raid, we always talk about, you know, as a, a, a big, um, jolt for the American people, but it was a very big jolt for the whole world because the whole world is, it was in very, very stress, very high turmoil, and was the first good news that the whole world had heard. And so that helped propel the war effort, even though it took us three more years, three and a half more years to uh, finish it off. But I think if there's anything that the Raiders would want people to remember, it would be that there is hope and there is the Americans, uh, they're very resilient. Uh, we were a very small military going into World War II. No one, I don't think the Germans or the Japanese thought that by the middle of 43, going into 44, that we could build a B-24 in 55 minutes with millions of parts. We weren't set, that, set up that way in 1941. So it, it was just, everything fell into place and we chugged along. And it was the resilience of not only the military, but the whole nation. So, um, and you guys know the rest of the story. They took off the Hornet and were able to bomb Tokyo. They didn't do a lot of damage, but they did enough because it told the Japanese people that had been lied to by their media and their military that they could not be touched. And that that um, really, it told the world. It, it, it was the foundation for the Air Force, even though airplanes had been around about 40 years and dad got to participate in at least three pillars that form up the, the Air Force. So he was very, very happy from a little kid in Dayton, Ohio, that he was gonna be lucky if he got to sell apples on the, the corner, you know, coming off the depression. So he was very pleased to be part of the military. And we were very happy to be a military family, Air Force military family. Thank you. And we were very happy to hear in Oakland County to be the home of the Doolittle Raiders. Thank you, Cindy Colshaw. <laughs> Dale, are you surprised that the Doolittle Raiders have not been made into a movie? Because of the story? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I was curious. Uh, were you not? Are you not surprised that the Doolittle Raiders story has not been made into a movie just on its own? Well, it has, but it sucked, <laughs> uh, and it desperately needs to be remade. Cindy, can I ask you a question? I, I read somewhere. Um, that they had stripped all the guns off of the B-25s. So why were the gunners? I mean, you said they were going to reuse them if they got to China. Turn your... Sorry. They had to do that to lighten it. They yeah. were trying to get as much fuel. And as it was, they had to, they had to leave the deck of the Hornet early because they were spotted, even though the Japanese knew they were coming. 
What the Japanese didn't know was that they were taking bombers that weren't going to return to the aircraft carrier. And that's what um, the Japanese knew it. They were just waiting another day to attack the, the whole fleet, okay? And that's how come Halsey, as soon as he got rid of them, and the, they were carpetbaggers, okay? And they, they knew it, the, the Army Air Corps. And uh, the, the Navy was spick and white and all shined up, and the, the Army Air Corps was the stepchild of the, the war anyway, right? And uh, they, the Army Air Corps, the, the, the guys didn't even have correct shoes. They all wore uh, Justin half boots. Uh, they're called, um, I don't know, calf boots or what. I mean, that was their outfit. And they, they um, in fact, uh, Lieutenant Miller had to give him instructions how to, to incorporate on the, the, on the ship. Uh, in fact, the Navy was not happy that they were there, but when they found out they were going to bomb Tokyo, then that gave them their, their card. But they had to strip the plane, um, and they knew they weren't going to be fighting. Um, they were going to drop the bombs and get out of there. Um, story, story of an enlisted man's life, right? Yeah, so. I'm a gunner on a B-25. They take off all the guns, and I still got to go. <laughs> So let us do this now. Let's move from 1942 to 1950, where the U.S. military is ordered to Korea in an effort to halt North Korean communists from overtaking South Korea. Eglin engineers are sent to Korea to collect data and design guided missiles for aircraft. I'm an honor to find out our good co-host Dale Dias has written a book about the Korean Odyssey. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that, sir. Yeah. Um, Korea has always been fascinating to me, uh, except for a few historians. Um, and, uh, and a few surviving veterans. Uh, it is literally the Forgotten War, uh, 1950 until 1953. Uh, it was a war that nobody was really prepared to fight. I mean, we had just gotten out of World War II. We just successfully uh, concluded World War II, uh, four or five years, depending on which side of the Atlantic you were on. Um, and now we got to go to war, a land war in Asia. What about that? Well, the uh, North Koreans came across the, the designated demilitarized zone, the 38th parallel, uh, on the 25th of June, uh, 1950. And as we say in the uh, Marine Corps, the defecation hit the oscillation. <laughs> and so uh, I can translate that to enlisted talk if you want me to. But, uh, but nobody was really prepared to fight this. Nobody knew what war in Korea would be like. And for the most part, the closest troops were in Japan, and they were relatively untrained garrison troops, post-World War II guys or guys who didn't get to go, and they were you know, just waiting around to get out, and suddenly, boom, war is declared. That war is not actually declared. It becomes a United Nations police action. Um, and when I was first going through my training as an enlisted Marine, uh, the guys who prepared me for my crucible that was to come later on in Southeast Asia were Korea guys. And these were guys who told me some things that just absolutely shocked me. These were guys who had uh, landed and fought through the Busan perimeter up to the Naktong bulge, made the big left hook around the Yellow Sea and landed in Incheon, and then turned left and went north all the way up across uh, chasing the, uh, the, North, the retreating North Koreans, who were there, there uh, immediately reinforced by hordes of Chinese. And uh, it was an extraordinary story. Um, I was told by some of these guys that, in fact, one of them, a very good friend of mine, uh, deceased now, he had never gone to boot camp. He absolutely had no training. He was in a reserve unit in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, waiting for a slot to go to boot camp. And they picked up his whole reserve unit, sent him out to Camp Pendleton and on his way to Korea. His whole training regime was on the ship on the way to Korea. And I said, my God, is that the hidebound Marine Corps? We let that happen? Well, apparently we did, and we did it in a number of cases. Because as I began to research the book, I found more and more guys who told me that. We were learning on the fly in Korea. And as I began to look at it, I said, you know, the air component of warfare in Korea 
was uh, really in large measure a learn on the fly also because Korea represented for the American military the dawn of the jet age. But nobody ever dog fought, if that's, is that how you say it? I dog fought, I dog fight, I dog fought. Nobody had ever engaged in air to air combat in a jet before. And so uh, it, was, it was a unique thing for our new United States Air Force. The Air Force was only two years old at this time as an official component of the Department of Defense. So it was the dawn of the jet age. And those veterans told me, you know, in all of the horror we had, moving up into North Korea and the frozen chosen and the freezing season, it would have been twice as bad if those MiGs or yaks out of China had come down and hit us. They didn't, and they didn't because airmen flying those F-86 Sabres that I dearly loved as a kid, I had nine models of them if I had one, they flew up into MiG Alley and kept that from happening. So while the guys on the ground didn't necessarily know it all the time, it became clearly obvious that things would have been a lot worse than they were if they'd been hit by MiGs. And that's down to the Air Force. That's down to the brand spanking new United States Air Force. The flat got them up there. But the Air Force was learning on the fly, if you will, up in MiG Alley. They were honing tactics. They were learning about attacks, deep attacks on enemy infrastructure, bridges, roads, that sort of thing, that keeps the bad guy from resupplying or reinforcing. The Air Force was learning how to do that. Now you'd think, well, they know all about that because they had the 8th Air Force and the 13th Air Force in World War II, and they know all about bombing, but this was a different deal. This was up there where you had to hit precision targets. You had to destroy those bridges over the Yalu. You couldn't just carpet bomb it. And so the Air Force was learning. And the neat thing is, they did. Logistics. Those of us who are professional soldiers, professional military men in one way or another, uh, we, we know that the professional talks logistics and the amateur talks tactics. But logistics, the business of resupplying by air that the United States Air Force actually invented, in some cases out of whole cloth, because the only real aerial resupply they had done, as Cindy mentioned, is in the CBI, the uh, China Burma India Theater, when they were flying the hum. But now they've got to resupply far flung outfits who are up to their eyeballs in snow and ice. Well, how do you do that with a C 47? Well, you invent it. And that's another thing about the Air Force that I've always admired their ability to innovate. Their ability to take a look at a problem and say, you know, nobody's ever done this before, but what the hell, let's go do it. And they do. That's an amazing thing. Uh, an example of that, if you will, uh, during the retreat from the Chosen Reservoir uh, in December of 1950, when the 1st Marine Division was trying to extricate itself from these screaming hordes of Chinese that had come across the yellow and suddenly popped up out of the snow, and they were ordered back to Wonsan. Some people call it a retreat. That is not a word that is in the Marine Corps Dictionary, by the way. So we were withdrawing and attacking in another direction. And, uh, and we hit an overpass, a chasm in the road, at a place called the Funchaliden Pass. And it had been knocked out by the North Koreans and the Chinese four or five times. Huge gap. And everything stopped right there at the Funchaliden Pass. What are we going to do here? How are we going to make this happen? Who's got bridge parts? And even if we could find bridge parts, which is a big deal, tons of metal, who can deliver them? Enter the United States Air Force in C-119s. And they literally flew those bridge parts over in the middle of the winter and dropped them by parachute. Now, there was a bit of experimentation there. Uh, two of the bridge parts ended up in North Korean hands, and uh, one of the bridge parts ended up damn near killing everybody because it fell in the wrong place. But enough of them got there. Enough of those navigators and those flight crews figured out with those old clamshell C-119s 
how to get those bridge parts into the Funchalent Pass, and they did. And that, thank you, United States Air Force, allowed that whole 1st Marine Division to pull back to Wonsan intact. And I wouldn't, uh, I would be remiss for those of you who've, who are in the rotary wing area, General, that would include you, uh, if I didn't mention the advent of helicopters. The rotor heads came into their own in Korea. Now, the helicopters weren't much to speak of, but they could go up this way and then that way and then down this way, which is pretty spectacular for an aircraft in those days. And the United States Air Force, the United States Army to some extent, and the United States Marine Corps learned how to use helicopters. And Lord knows the helicopter's the king of the battlefield these days. It used to be artillery, nah, it's helicopters. They are spectacular. And all of that was innovation by airmen and air crews who were just learning how the hell this thing works. And our helicopters don't fly anyway, they just beat the air into submission. And, and that was all launched in Korea. So, well, 1948 to 1950 isn't much history to build on. But those people from the United States Army Air Forces who became our United States Air Force were innovators. They were magicians. These were the guys who just figured it out, just got her done. And that, among other things, I'll tell you something about it later, but that, among other things, is one of the reasons I accepted this invitation to come down here and be with this wonderful community. Because I know about and I respect adapt, innovate, and overcome, and that's the legacy of your Air Force. Thank you, Captain Dale. You know, before we move on, I'm so glad my dad was in the Korean War and the chosen few, so I was very, very honored for that. Thank you, my friend. Before we go on, I'd be remiss if we didn't go backtrack to June 6, 1944, Saving Private Ryan, arguably the greatest beginning of a movie ever. That was your idea, I suppose. Of course it was. <laughs> Spielberg had nothing to do with it. Uh, but I, I, will, I will say this, Ted. I, I got my General Eisenhower fix that day. We had, I stood up on a, on a beach overlooking, it was actually in Curraclo in southeast Ireland, County Wexford. Uh, it was the only beach that Ireland would allow us to tear the hell out of, which is uh, what we intended to do. And we had 1,000 men on the beach, mostly Irish, uh, uh, sort of, I guess you'd call them National Guard, part-time soldiers. Um, and we had uh, seven ships at sea, no, seven armored vehicles tanks and amphibian tractors coming ashore, and uh, five ships at sea. And I had to control all of this on one radio. And I remember just before we got ready, something like five cameras running, and Spielberg's looking at me and he's kind of cross-eyed. Is this gonna work? I said, listen, here's the deal, Stephen. You could, we, we spent weeks training these guys so that they, they can load an M1 and load a BAR, and you saw some of that in that, in that opening uh, video. Um, because we wanted them all to reload on the fly, you know, so they could keep the action going. And, and uh, I said, listen, here's the deal, boss. You can say action, and everybody will go. But don't even bother trying to say cut or anything else, because this crap is gonna go on until they run out of ammo, and that's the deal. But it was an extraordinary, uh, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary sight to see, uh, because uh, I've had veterans tell me that it was as close to what happened on Omaha on June 6, 1944, as we could get. So I was delighted to be able to work on that picture. And, and then from there, also, we were chatting about movies last night. Band of Brothers, arguably the greatest series ever. And you had a chance to meet some of the actual Band of Brothers. And I'm curious as to messages you learned from those guys, because they were gone for four years. So tell me the messages you can share with the airmen about how the Band of Brothers got along and such. Yeah, the, um, it, it was indeed a Band of Brothers. I trained them for three weeks. I actually isolated them and I took them back to 1944. We actually went up to the number one parachute school at Bryce Norton and I put them through ground school and I made them think like 1944. 
And that was the year I was born, so I, I wasn't very conscious of anything at that point. But uh, I had talked to a lot of a lot of the veterans who told me what what their basic training was about, and it was more about unity. It was more about cohesion. It was more about building a team. Now I've I've always been exceedingly pissed off. Oh, sorry, that's was I've always been exceedingly upset with management in the military. That just sucks, um, because we're warriors, uh, or we're supposed to be. Uh, and you lead a warrior, you manage some Scooby-Doo clown on a bar stool. I, I guess my enlisted time is coming out here. But uh, so, <laughs> to answer your question, the the uh, the mission was to to give them an insight into that warrior spirit, into that connection that we all feel when we're an extremist, when lives are on the line. And give them an insight to that dark humor that we use to fight off the pathos. Um, and so everything we did was built to that. We'd run five miles in the morning, run singing and chanting so that they could hear the rhythm of their feet when they struck. And if you listen, never mind how tired you are and how exhausted you are, if you listen to that, that's the sound of power. That's the sound of unity. And that's what we were trying to build with the Head of Brothers, and I, th I think we did it. And, and don't eat any spaghetti before you run if you've seen the movie, uh, my friend. So, you know, let's jump from 1940. Haven't seen that movie, you're a communist. Sorry. <laughs> 1944, I want to jump to 1964, where my co host yeah. enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps, who was in one of the first units sent to Vietnam in 1965. He served in combat for many years as an infantryman and combat correspondent. He has a unique perspective on the importance of air support, as you shared. So, Dale, if you don't mind, let's talk about Vietnam. All right, one Vietnam. more time, and then I promise we're going to get to the important people over here. And by the way, I'm humbled to be in their presence. These are the real air pioneers right over here. Let's hear it. Uh, I presume, because I see the color of some of your uniforms, and uh, because I know that what Eglin and Herbert means to this community. So I'm, I'm aware that most of you probably know um, about the critical and the crucial role that air power played in our war in Vietnam. Look, as an infantryman, I'm not the guy to give you insights to that sort of thing. I mean, I can't tell you much about the operations of the 7th and the 13th Air Forces in Vietnam beginning with Farm Gate in 1961, uh, through Rolling Thunder, Arc Light, Eagle Thrust, Linebacker, many other major operations in between 1965 and 1973. That, those details, those insights, really should be given to you by airmen who were involved in that. They can tell you from a personal perspective about uh, delivering 6.1 million tons of aviation ordnance during the war. They can relate the man-killing tempo of air operations that eventually cost uh, our Air Force more than 2,500 killed in action and 500 still missing in action. See, I can't tell you those things from any sort of an insightful perspective. What I can tell you about, from the perspective of a very humbled and grateful infantryman, is about things like watching a pair of Air Force F-4s deliver close air support while we were in close contact with a North Vietnamese Army unit. They would deliver what we call snake and nape, snake eye general purpose bombs, and followed by a napalm. And uh, when I say close air support, folks, that is precisely what I mean. We'd look up and see those F-4s coming at us, and if the pilots were sober, they would be coming right over our heads, right, and of course they were, it's a bad joke. Uh, they would be coming right over our heads, headed at the enemy, and we'd look up and see those snake eyes drop from the wings and they'd pop these little fins and then fly themselves right into the target. Except that from that perspective, it sh damn sure looked like the target was me, 
because they were coming right at us and then they hit us, hit napalm and you, the air gets sucked out of your lungs and you can feel that heat. And we were okay, but the North Vietnamese Army wasn't, which was precisely the point of the uh, whole exercise. So I can tell you about that sort of thing. I can tell you about having to hump back. Hump means walk with heavy things. I can tell you about having to hump back a full grid square. We were on our way to the objective up or the demilitarized zone. And some clown calls and says, no, hold them. You got to turn around and you got to hump back a full kilometer, full grid square. What? The enemy's up there and you want us to go here. That's not the Marine Corps way. As it turns out, the reason for that was because they were going to run an arc light mission. The buffs. Big, ugly, f uh, you know the rest. <laughs> B-52s were going to come over and hit that objective that we were headed for. Now, we were danger close, as close as they will let the ground be to an airstrike, for B-52s was one grid square, 1,000 meters. And when they dropped, we actually felt the ground shake. And then we went up to do what you all know is a BDA, a bomb damage assessment. We went up to, and it was hair, eyes, and teeth all over the area. They did some damage. And it was at that moment that guys like me got a real appreciation for air power. That saved lives. I can tell you about being in a foxhole in a night attack. Bad guys coming in all the time, trying to slide into the hole and slide a bayonet in your ribs. I can tell you about that. And I can tell you what kept it from happening. It was a thing called Puff the Magic Dragon, or Spooky, AC-47 gunships. We'll hear it later on from some guys who actually flew them, and they'll tell you some more details. But what I remember, what I will never forget is looking out into the night where the enemy was trying to move in on us, and it looked like a meteor shower out there. Just magic. Puff the magic dragon. And then you'd hear, ah, ah, ah. And those were those Gao 8 machine guns. And I'm telling you, that is music to an infantryman's ear. They kept us going. Now, I can also tell you about a little time at a place called Quezon. We were there for 77 days. And we would have starved and run flat Winchester on ammunition had it not been for the United States Air Force flying C-130s. They would come in, and we were in bunkers because any time an aircraft tried to get anywhere near the ground at Quezon, the enemy would open up with rockets, 122s, 80 deuce mortars, and just nail the airstrip anywhere they could. So the airmen figured this out. They said, well, we won't land. They'll probably, we'll just probably get a nail in the tire anyway. What we'll do is we'll fly that C-130 in as low as it can get, and we'll pop the ramp down and back, and we'll put some parachutes on all that cargo back there, and we'll pop the parachutes, whoo, out it goes, and then those knuckle-dragging, nose-picking grunts can come out and get their chow and their ammo and whatever they need. It was absolutely amazing. Now, the airmen who were in the bunkers with us, who were controlling that, called it Low Altitude Parachute Extraction System, or LAPS. Let me tell you what the Marines called it. We called it a goddamn miracle. A couple of years ago, I did a movie, uh, and this is the last thing I'll say because I really want to hear from these guys, but uh, a couple of years ago, I did a movie called The Last Full Measure. Some of you may have seen it, it and if you haven't, you're a communist, um, because it was about an airman, a PJ, a parachute jumper, a medic, named William Pitsenbarger. Um, and the efforts of his fellow PJs to try to get him the Medal of Honor uh, many years after he was killed. Uh, he's the kind of guy who was lowered down out of, his head, out of his helicopter to pick up the wounded on the ground and try to save lives. And he volunteered to stay on the ground 
and help the grunts, help the infantry. And he waved the helicopter off and off they went. He saved countless lives. In 1966, at a battle near Binwa. Uh, and we found out about his story. Uh, he had gotten the Air Force Cross for that action. And uh, his unit of PJs, pararescue folks, decided that wasn't good enough. We decided it wasn't good enough. And they campaigned to get him the Medal of Honor, which he later got. But that, to me, uh, as a former enlisted man, uh, was an extraordinary story that needed to be told. And the more I got into it, and the more I met the Pitsenbarger family, and the more I heard from some of the, guys, some of the survivors who were with him, uh, I, I said to the director and the writer, I said, you know, this, this tells a story that's a whole lot bigger than one battle in Vietnam. This tells the story of selflessness, of service, and of sacrifice. And if you look into it, if you look behind the scenes, that's what the United States Air Force is about. So thanks for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dale. Our next speaker on the panel, I first knew him. He was on the Oklahoma County School Board. That's how I first heard about Howard Hill. And then I saw the soccer complex located right down the road here called the Howard Hill Soccer Complex. It wasn't until after I met Howard that I found out that Colonel Howard Hill was an F-4D pilot with the Triple Nickel Tactical Fight Squadron in Thailand. Then a first lieutenant, he flew numerous strike missions into North Vietnam, earning the Distinguished Flying Cross and Civil Star Medal twice. On December 16, 1967, he was forced to eject over North Vietnam, where he was captured and held as a prisoner of war. After spending 1,915 days in captivity, First Lieutenant Hill was released during Operation Homecoming on March 14, 1973. He continued his career, ultimately retiring as colonel. My friend, Colonel Howard Hill, please tell us your story. Thank you, Ted, and uh, Dale, you're going to be a tough act to follow. <laughs> Enjoyed the story, though. Uh, I first arrived at Eglin back on December 15, 1966, to be in six weeks of training to become an F-4 backseater with follow-on orders to Vietnam. Normally, F-4 training back then took six months to become combat ready, but they were going to give us 30 hours flying time to deem us combat capable and then pipeline to Vietnam. After a month here, they canceled the order, and I got to stay permanent stationed here with the 33rd Tactical Fighter Squadron. One good thing about my getting extended was uh, being able to court my future wife, whom I just met uh, just before Christmas. In May, our squadron deployed to Thailand, bringing the first F-4D models in theater, and we started flying missions over to Laos and North Vietnam. On December 16, 1967, I was on a 70th mission over North Vietnam on the outskirts of Hanoi. Our job was to protect the strike force from enemy uh, fighters, and we engaged four MiG-17s. After a few minutes of dogfighting, dog fighting, uh, the MiGs broke off. A MiG-21 had been perched 23,000 feet above us, visually directing the MiG-17s, swooped in from behind, fired off a heat-seeking missile, went on front of number two engine, and blew the tail off the airplane. And so our choice was to eject. I later learned after I returned to the States that the MiG-21 pilot was actually a North Korean who became an ace. As soon as I stood up on landing, standing 10 feet in front of me, were two young men dressed in pith helmets and military uniforms, looking, staring down the sights of their rifles, bayonets on the ends of them. And then off to my left, I heard a hoopla and about 50 yards out of the woods, come about 40 or 50 excited peasants. And I later heard that uh, one reason they were probably happy was in those days, uh, the central government, Hanoi, was offering 50 kilograms, that's 110 pounds, of rice for the village for capturing an American. So I guess they figured they are going to eat well. My third seater was captured about four hours after that, and that night we were loaded on board a helicopter and flown into Hanoi to begin our stay in the Hanoi Hilton. Now, People hear a lot about our stories, about the POWs, but you hear very little sometimes, uh, very little about the plight of the wives and the families. In many cases, the wives and the families 
really didn't know whether their loved one was dead or alive. And if they did have word their loved one was captured, they didn't know when or even if their loved one was going to be returning because the war was basically open-ended. And then there was always a question, should the returner return, what physical and or mental condition they would be in. So some would feel that in some regards, in some respects, the families and wives actually had it worse than we did, had it harder. Now, a grassroots level that was led by the wives and the family raised public awareness about our situation and pressed for our treatment to be held, or to be held in accordance with the Geneva Conventions on the Treatment of Prisoners of War. My wife, Libby, was a founding and active member of the National League of Families of American Prisoners and Missing in Southeast Asia and undertook numerous speaking engagements in the Washington, D.C. area at the request of DOD and the State Department. My mom and dad even traveled with a group of other family members, paid for by Ross Perot, by the way, to Paris to meet with the ambassador of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the official name of North Vietnam. One memorable instance locally in support of POWs was a Sunday edition of the Fort Walton Beach Playground Daily News in September 1970, in which the entire front page was written in Vietnamese, and it was an open letter to North Vietnam exhorting them to treat the POWs humanely and to release their names and other information. An extra 12,000 copies of the edition were published and sent throughout the country, with 1,000 of them flown to Andrews Air Force Base by Eglin for distribution to every congressman and to every foreign embassy. My wife knew it was 1,000 copies because she's the one that picked them up at Andrews. I heard the publisher later learned that the Vietnamese translator had taken a little literary license and inserted a few colorful words, albeit in Vietnamese. He never knew what to expect from our captors. On Christmas Eve 1969, one of my roommates and I were taken to a small auditorium in our camp and to join about 30 other POWs who were seated there. It appeared to be a Christmas Eve church service, but with movie cameras sticking in the open windows, it was ob obviously a propaganda shoot. U.S. intelligence was able to obtain a copy of the film from East Germany, and they made five by seven photos of every other frame. The one on the screen is taken of me, at least I hope Seth has it on the screen. Uh, interestingly, my wife and my mom ID'd it, that of me. My dad insisted it was not me. <laughs> and then one sad note, my wife Libby was told by the Air Force Casualty Office <laughs> that 28 other families ID'd me as their loved one. That's how much they hoped. So, With the exception of the Sante Raid, that you're going to hear about shortly from Larry, for over four years, there were no U.S. aircraft operating over the Hanoi area. On March 31, 1968, President Johnson suspended all bombing north of the 20th parallel. Hanoi was 21 degrees north. And then on November 1st, he spent all bombing in North Vietnam. And the U.S. did not resume bombing in North Vietnam until May 1972. After the bombing resumed in May of 1972, and they moved us all back to the central prisons, Wallo and, and Hanoi, seven of us were conjecturing one day about how much longer the war would go on, and we arrived at a consensus of about another 10 to 15 years. And believe it or not, that seemed entirely reasonable to us because of the way the pace of the conduct of the war had been going on thus far. And I have no doubt we would have served that long, or if necessary, even longer, because we were determined we would return home with honor. But fortunately, we did not have to, because President Nixon authorized Linebacker II, which is the most massive aerial bombardment since World War II. It was conducted December 18th, 29th, 1972, and was known as Christmas bombing. It was costly. We lost 28 aircraft, including 16 B-52s with five-man crews, and only one B-52 crew made it back intact. But it was successful and led to the Paris Peace Accords and our repatriation the following February and March, and our repatriation the Petition following February and March. But I'd like to brag that in 12 days, President Nixon brought an end to a war that had been going on for 12 years. Importantly, 
by our freedom, we were rewarded for our faith in our country. In closing, I'd like to thank you. In closing, I want to share two of my favorite quotes. One by the late John McCain. I'm no hero, but I had the honor to serve in the company of heroes. And the other by Jeremiah Denton. He was later a U.S. Senator from Alabama, great guy. And who, after having been a POW for four and a half, over seven and a half years, and who was a senior ranking officer on the first C-141 repatriation flight into Clark Air Base in the Philippines on February 12, 1972, And what he said, the words are beautiful. We are honored to have observed our country under difficult circumstances. We're profoundly grateful to our commander Chief, and to our nation for this day, God bless America. And in time with that, one of the things we did when we were tapping, we closed off when we could. We always sent the same message, GBU, GBA, God bless you, God bless America. Thank you. Sir. Yes, sir. Howard, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, I don't know if I'll have an okay. answer, but I can. <laughs> you need to answer. Hey, but, hey, uh, you, I'll have to find an answer. It may not be the right one. But. <laughs> you were talking to me earlier about um, the rules of engagement and the restricted Oh, yes. Areas. I mean, yeah. you were flying. Your squadron flew out of Yubon, right? Mm-hmm. And Yubon, uh, Thailand. And it had to be frustrating. I mean, I've worked with rules of engagement, and they mm -hmm. all suck like a Hoover vacuum cleaner. I mean, I understand that. Yep. But, but really, there were areas where you knew they were, and they knew you couldn't bomb? And oh, yeah. Around Hanoi, there was a circle there that they knew we couldn't hit in. Um, we could uh, bomb in Laos and North, uh, or conduct uh, combat operations in Laos and uh, North Vietnam. We couldn't conduct any in South Vietnam. In fact, what was frustrating, you mentioned the Marines at Quezon. When their ammo dump got hit and it burned for four days, uh, you could see it at night because it was the fire. You could see the smoke during the day. We could bomb on, they were right there just on the very south edge of the demilitarized zone. We could bomb on the north side, but we couldn't bomb on the south side. And they were facing two battalions in North Vietnamese regulars there. Uh, so it sort of hurt in a way that, um, well, we could bomb on the north side, but uh, we had to rely on the guys that were stationed in South Vietnam. They were the ones that could attack there. So. Yeah, it was uh, stupid, but that's the way it was. Salute and march on. You're yeah. an inspiration, Howard. Thanks. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you, Howard Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I recently read a naval history publication that said, early after midnight on November 21st, 1970, the U.S. Navy in the Gulf of Tonkin executed what should be lauded as the greatest special operations deception in modern warfare by assisting the Army and the Air Force in their attempt to rescue American POWs from Sante in North, uh, North Vietnam. In the book, The Sante Prison Rescue Mission, the writer indicates, Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Robka, the group's senior operations officer, was quiet, enthusiastic, but subdued, poised, and confident. He enjoyed everyone's respect. His cohorts called him an inspiring guy. If there was one real brain in the Sante planning, they said it was Larry Roca. I'm very pleased to introduce now Colonel U.S. Uh, Air Force retired and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Colonel Larry Roca. Larry. Ted, I'm uh, sorry to say that your introduction smacked a lot of the disinformation that we used in the Sante raid. <laughs> you need to watch that. <laughs> By the spring of 1970, there were over 500 Americans in prisons in North Vietnam. Our prisoners were held mostly in and around Hanoi and smaller outlying camps where their treatment was brutal. Some had been there for several years and had given up all hope of ever getting out. Providence stepped in in the form of timing and the assembly, assembly of a remarkable team of special operators. Years of around-the-clock bombing had precluded any thought of a rescue. Uh, North Vietnam air defenses were state-of-the-art, and they were well-trained, particularly around Hanoi. 
In regard to timing, a bombing halt had been declared in the fall of 1869, as we've just talked about already. There were few air operations going on in North Vietnam for more than six months, and only a few high-altitude reconnaissance missions. At home in the spring of 70, the failure of the following, following our no man left behind policy was boiling over, especially in, in senior military circles. General Don Blackburn, Special Assistant to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Brigadier General James Allen, my boss, decided to do something that something had to be done. On a Friday and early in May, General Blackburn arranged a meeting of seven of us that he and General Allen had personally scouted, three Army, three Air Force, and a Navy. First, he had the chief of the DIA intelligence officer that tracked all POW matters brief us about what they knew about the location and circumstances of the prisoners. General Blackburn followed, saying, your job is to get prisoners out of the camp. You have my word of honor. I will provide any resource the Defense Department or even our country has to get some prisoners back. He then said, come back Monday and tell me what you need. At the meeting Monday, we decided the first order of business was to get out of the leaky Pentagon. Absolute secrecy was clearly the elephant in the room. It was paramount. It influenced all the elements of the operation. We also specified that no written communications of any type be used. Face-to-face -face contacts were secure phone only. A day later, we began planning in an abandoned and empty house in, on nearby Fort Myer. We only had yellow tablets, some charts, a few photos of prison camps, and a table with a few chairs. It was a providential group of tailor-made talent, experience, and self-evident trustworthiness. Sound ideas were rapidly tossed on the table, and many were adopted on the spot. Within a few days, the basic concept was born. The Sante prison was selected because it was somewhat isolated, and it had features that would aid in accurately navigating to it in the dim moonlight. Also, operation could not be, the operation could not be done until after the monsoon late season in late September. The mixed formations of aircraft could only operate in night at night in clear conditions. After hours of deliberation, it was decided the absolutely mandatory goal was getting control of the prison within one minute after the landing. That was to preclude any chance of guards killing the prisoners in event of an escaped attempt. Landing helicopters outside the compound and breaking in was ruled out as much too slow and risk our troops shooting at each other until ultimately we decided our only alternative was to land a smaller helicopter with a small team right inside the compound. That was exceptionally risky because even with a perfectly executed approach, the helicopter's rotor would hit the outer branches of the trees in the courtyard. Five larger CH-3 helicopters with the 45-man main force would almost simultaneously land outside the walls to defend the perimeter, and some of these troops would also break through the wall a little later to help the troops inside the prison. Flying over 300 miles at very low levels over Karst Mountains in Laos, with no lights and in radio silence, the combat Talon C-130 leading the CH-3 would pop up approaching the prison and drop flares so the CH-3 could see to land in a very tight space. The CH-53s would strafe the gun towers at the corners of the compound as they made their approach. Overhead, five A-1 fighter bombers, led by another combat talent, circled standing by to attack any threat from the city or nearby military facility. Both were within a quarter of a mile. Ten F-4 fighters, would be standing by to intercept any MiG activity that might threaten the assault force.
five F-105s accompanied the F-4s to defend against surface-to-air missiles and actually did engage them. One getting a punctured fuel tank, the pilot bailed out over Laos and was rescued by a returning C-130 on their way home. After deplaning the helicopters at the prison, the helicopters flew to an island on a lake a mile or so from the prison where they idled for 27 minutes, then returned to pick up the assault team. Concurrent with operations at the prison as a diversion, offshore Navy aircraft carriers launched more than 75 aircraft that simulated a major attack just inland near Hanoi. They dropped flares and performed recognizable uh, attack maneuvers. Other supporting forces were C-130 tankers to refuel the helicopters and C-135s to refuel the fighters. Signal Intelligence College I C-131s just offshore collected and relayed real-time information to General Miner, the task force commander, commander. The assault went mostly as planned, although we had to switch to an alternative at, our, at the prison. A number of eternal, uh, alternative tactical plans, assuming the loss of any one aircraft, have been frequently practiced almost as much as the base plan. Training for this was conducted here at Aglin. The Army troops were confined to Field 3 and only allowed off base for a few socials on the beach. Air Force personnel were blended into normal activities, but followed persistently by two dedicated security officers rumored to have authority to fire, fire anyone that made a misstep. It was a good rumor. <laughs> it worked. An exact dimensional simulation of the prison was constructed on a nearby range, using poles and 12-foot wide fabric to represent outer walls and those of the interior buildings. Bamboo poles marked the perimeter of the tree foliage where the C1 through, CH3 would land. More than, uh, don't have the number there. Hours of training were completed, including dress rehearsal. Flown, uh, the dress rehearsal was flown to the Blue Ridge Mountains to accurately replicate the mission conditions. After the President's approval to go, Task Force Commander General Miner and four planners proceeded to sink back in Hawaii and then 7th Air Force Headquarters in Saigon. The commanders were briefed and asked to instruct the in-theater support units to do exactly what the visiting planners asked for. What a good deal. They did it in spades. Uh, secret phone calls were made, not disclosing the, the purpose of the mission, but what they should do, and hand-carried letters uh, instructing them to come immediately if they had not had any problem from uh, had any problem. Uh, this worked great. We, we went out first and visited all the bases, the F5s, the 105s, and the others uh, walked in with that letter in hand, and uh, all we got was, yes, sir. They and in theater unit leaders conversed at Tok Lee to detail the final planning and coordinate timing of the elements. Basically, we just told them we wanted their brightest and smartest guy to come to Tok Lee and do whatever he says he needs to do when he comes home. The launch was scheduled for the evening of the 19th, but was delayed to the 20th by weather. The mission launched the following evening with Air Force and Army elements supporting essentially as planned. As you know, the prisoners had been moved and were not there. They had been secretly moved 15 miles east. I was monitoring the operation from the command post at Udor in Thailand where I had launched and recovered the helicopters. We had selected the term items as a code word for prisoners that we used throughout from the day one of the, the uh, planning. We never used the word prisoner. When the call came that there was no items, it was simply crushing. Although we were not successful in returning prisoners, the positive impact of the raid on the prisoners was large and immediate. The prisoners' outlying camps were consolidated in Hanoi, and there, within view of international agencies like the Red Cross, the treatment improved markedly. 
and activities flourished that greatly improved their outlook. When we have joint reunions with the ex-prisoners, the ex-prisoners continue to express their heartfelt appreciation for the raid. You might ask, what is my takeaway from, from this, this experience? Simply put, it's a story, a story of courage, trust, and ingenuity. From the Joint Chiefs of Staff to Blackburn and Allen, and up and down the chain of command, trust was boldly displayed. The President wrote a note to Admiral Moore the night before the raid expressing his trust in the plan, even stating that he would not allow second-guessing if it failed. To sum it up, in many ways around myriad show-stopping problems were always found, often unconventional and almost always involving high risk. Most importantly, they were quickly accepted and incorporated. These are the essence of special operations and what the airmen of her race every day. They deserve our greatest appreciation and help at home when their partners are deployed. My time is up with this drawing that appeared in Time Magazine just after the raid pretty well sums it up. That's it. Thank you. Colonel Larry Ropka, to round out our Vietnam local, I, I had heard of that there were Vietnam refugee camps uh, somewhere real close by here, but I was not here in 1975, so I didn't know about it. So as I was chatting with Larry, I said, hey, do you know anything about it? He goes, do I know anything about it? My buddy, Colonel Bill Keeler, was in charge. So on April 27, 1975, Colonel Bill Keeler was selected as the United States Air Force representative to develop and execute a plan to maintain order and efficiency and be responsible for the health, welfare, and morale of a forecasted 10,000 Vietnam refugees who would be transported to Eglin Air Force Base in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. Just one week later, the first 373 refugees arrived in Oklahoma County, and this gentleman was in charge, Colonel Bill Keeler. In April of 1975, Saigon fell. The U.S. recognized that their obligation to rescue and resettle those high-risk Vietnamese who had worked closely with the Americans and whose lives and families would be in jeopardy. On Tuesday, April 27th, the Eglin commander, Major General Lane, called a meeting to inform his local area commanders of the events that were about to occur. The Army, Navy, and the Air Force, each individually were tasked to handle the arrival and care of refugees for the duration of their settlement. I was the Commandant of the Special Operations School at Hurlburt and was surprised to be named as the Commander of the Air Force effort to prepare and sustain a facility to accommodate the new arrivals. Eglin Field II was an abandoned World War II training facility 12 miles from the main gate at Eglin. It was selected. There was no housing on it, but it contained an inoperative water tower and the remains of water and sewer lines. We started building 500 tents which we thought would probably hold between 10 and 12 cups each, plus extra tents for showers, five field kitchens, and meal tents. Five days later, on May the 2nd, the first aircraft arrived at Eglin with 373 refugees. They were met by a very small number of us at 2 a.m. using hand gestures we directed the new arrivals to buses for a trip to the refugee center and to find cots and latrine tents. Uh, they carried their sole possessions in sacks, pillowcases, or briefcases from Saigon. Care was taken to keep families together, very important for them. They followed 
The following morning, they begin their new life with an American breakfast and a tour of the sites. A few refugees saw the ongoing construction and volunteered to assist with building more tents and facilities. Security, as always, was a concern. And my initial effort consisted of a single rope strung on stanchions surrounding the four miles of perimeter of the area. Signs were hung on the rope in English, do not go beyond this rope. The Vietnamese version said, uh, this is a rope. <laughs> Language was an ever-present problem. <laughs> With not security, nobody left. As a commander of the Refugee Reception Center, I wore blouse fatigues and a red ball cap with letters Arlo 1, Refugee Liaison Officer Number 1. My staff and I had daily walking staff meetings around the camp, visible to all. This seemed to produce a very secure feeling among the guests, and each section consisted but drew by tents with the current roster of persons living there and a fatigue uniform U.S. Air Force person with a red leather, red leather ball cap, Arlo, also to monitor and assist guests in whatever problems they had. Air traffic loads of refugees continued to arrive almost daily. On May 9th, we had a big day. 1,962 refugees arrived within 24 hours. I had used TV and radio stations to invite churches, the YMCA, Red Cross, and other organizations, and individuals to help with sponsorship. These groups and the Air Commando Association uh, assisted with entertainment, setting up a library, providing movies, organizing sports and games, and teaching many classes. Clothing donations came from everywhere, and our volunteers, thank goodness, took over the monumental task of distribution. We logged a total of 2,352 community volunteers who were responsible for easing many potential problems for these people who had already had more than their share. At first, the GI kitchens were not a huge success. The Vietnamese, of course, preferred an Asian diet to American cuisine out of a field kitchen. But before long, the Vietnamese ladies were asked to asking to take over much of the food preparation. <laughs> rice was mandatory. Not just any rice, though. A special kind of rice, and it wasn't minimum made. The, the information handout it quickly outgrew itself, and the daily newspaper was established in mid-May. We called it Dat Moy, New Land. And was printed in English and Vietnamese. Both local volunteers and refugees worked on the paper, which included international news, refugee center news, Saigon post-war news, kitchen hours, and even some cartoons. We settled American and Vietnamese, we celebrated American Vietnamese holidays and that Moy became the link that bound them to their new home in America. Even with the thousands of arrivals, problems are minimal. One of my favorites was the constant undersupply of Kotex. We found out the refugees were using them, finally, to line their cots for more comfort. <laughs> Eglin and in Hurlburt in Okaloosa County, with only five days' notice, welcomed, sheltered, and fed over 10,000 Vietnamese, plus 13 new babies, between May and September 16th, when the last meal was served. For all of us involved, 
we can proudly say we lived up to the Air Commando and Special Operations motto, anytime, any place. Thank you, Bill. Before we just sit, before I let panel one go, I would like to add, that's the conclusion of our Vietnam component thing with Dale and his other stories. Are there any Vietnam veterans in the audience right now that we could stand and recognize? There we go. Well done, gentlemen. Thank you. Chuck Merkel's out there. My friends, we are now going to uh, have panel one take a break here. Cindy and Howard and Larry and Bill were very appreciative of that. Thank you very much, my friends. Coming up in just a moment is our next round where we're going to talk about Operation Eagle Claw and Grenada and Desert Storm and, uh, and uh, Afghanistan and end with our good friend General Webb to talk about the Bin Laden, uh, bin Laden uh, situation. So while we're waiting, how about Jerry Williams? Let's have a word from our sponsor. I'd like to thank you. We can't have an event like this without sponsorship from companies like the Boeing Company, who is very, very kind. And in this case, our good friend Jerry Williams from Eglin Federal Credit Union. Now, a word from our sponsor. All right, a word from your sponsor. Thank you, Ted. We appreciate that. And thank you and the Fort Wayne Chamber for putting this event on today. This is quite historic to hear so many things about the events that have, have had a significant impact uh, from Okaloosa County and the military units around here. We're honored to be here, and, and I'm honored to represent Eglin Federal Credit Union as one of the sponsors. And I know that John and Matt from Boeing are here, and thank you, gentlemen, for your, your part in this. Master Sergeant Holly Graham, she's the airman that came up with a theme for the 75th anniversary of the United States Air Force. She came up with a theme of innovate, accelerate, and thrive. I heard recently from General Slife how the Air Force has innovated recently, taking the cruise missile, putting it on a pallet, airdropping it out of the back of a C1, an MC-130J, taking two mature parts, components of the Air Force and finding innovative ways to deliver that munition into places where you normally wouldn't be able to deliver it. So the, the Air Force in, is innovating. We're witnessing that today with all of these speakers that are here bringing us their stories. They've contributed greatly to the defense of our nation and the freedoms that we enjoy. As the Eklund community has grown up around us, so has many of the organizations that support the, the military community. Eklund Air Force or Eklund Federal Credit Union is one of those. We were stood up in 1954. We've been serving members of this community for 68 years. We too are growing. You might have seen the new operations center that we're building on Beale Street. That's going to be a back office operations center for us. We're keeping the main headquarters on Eklund Parkway because we're growing. We're expanding. We're also building branches in Freeport and in Pace, Florida, as we continue to grow. There are others being planned. We have many employees that are military spouses. That keeps us in touch with the military. But we also sponsor and we participate in a lot of different things throughout this area. I had the privilege of serving as an honorary commander for the 24th Special Operations Group, WING, back in 2015. What a privilege it was to learn about all the things that go on behind the gate at Herbert Field. I grew up fishing in that little pond down there by Gator Lakes and watched all of the C-130s fly in and out of there. Nobody really knew or cared that we were there. Things have changed <laughs> quite a bit, I promise you that. But growing up here, I was able to see what happened a bit. Being an honorary commander brought a lot of that to life for me. Same thing with being a civic leader for the 33rd Fire Wing uh, with AETC. I learned a lot about what goes on at Eglin, and I'm very impressed with that. We not only provide financial services uh, to everybody, we also sponsor a lot of events. I'm going to give a shameless plug to one that's coming up this Saturday. The James Benneker Memorial, you heard about uh, Chief Benneker, the Chief, ninth Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force earlier. They're having a race out of the Air Force Enlisted Village, our friends there, for, I think the seventh or eighth year in a row as a fundraiser. So if you're a runner, that's a great event to join. If you're not a runner, uh, then I invite you to join us tomorrow night for a salute to veterans where we salute the Okaloosa County residents who have been inducted into the Florida Hall of Fame. Quite a, a lot of accomplishments there. It's our privilege to serve all of the military communities, communities around here. 
Throughout the years, we've watched you innovate, we've watched you accelerate, and we've watched you thrive. So Ted, I'm gonna turn it back over to you as we continue to celebrate the Air Force turning 75. Thank you. Well done, Jerry. Thank you very kindly, Edwin Federal Credit Union. Let's bring up panel number two. We had uh, obviously went long on that first round. That was uh, very informative. Let's start out with Chief Master Sergeant Bill Walter, veteran of Operations Eagle Claw, uh, Urgent Fury, and lots and lots of other ones. Lieutenant Colonel Kirby Locklear, veteran of Operations in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Grenada, El Salvador, etc. Lieutenant Colonel Corby Martin, Operations Desert Storm, and so on and so forth. And Colonel Allison Black. AC-130 gunship navigator and current first special operations wing commander. And back to see us again, Lieutenant General Marshall Brad Webb, who has a plethora of honors, et cetera, and he's here today. So we're so honored to go have round two this situation. I'm gonna start now, if I could, with uh, Chief Marshal Sergeant. On November 4th, 1979, Iranian militants stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, Iran, and took the embassy staff hostage. Diplomatic efforts to release the hostages was not successful, and every night the situation was the lead news story. What is not widely known is Herward Field personnel began training for a mission to Iran within 48 hours of the storming of the embassy, and were ultimately involved in an aborted rescue mission in April of 1980. Chief Walter, as veteran of that operation, can you share your thoughts with us, sir? Certainly. Uh, I think there's probably some people here in the audience that are surprised saying, why is there a gunship guy briefing about Operation Eagle Claw? How does that happen? All right. Well, first, it requires a little bit of setup. Uh, on Herbert Field, I got here in 1978. Uh, that's the last century for you young people. And I, I can tell you, it was uh, a lot of ways parallel to what we're seeing right now. It was the uh, end of a big conventional war and gunships were being spooled back. Uh, pretty much everything in the special operations capacity was being diminished for uh, the war against Russia. That was the focus. I was a gunner on AC-130s when I got here, and uh, the activity on Herbert was very slight. I think that's a good way of putting it. Uh, were we prepared to do a mission to Iran? I'd say no, uh, but that didn't stop us from trying. The very first attempt that we had was called, or the planning mission was called Operation Rice Bowl. And it was deliberately named to divert, or to, uh, divert attention uh, because we actually trained in, uh, in Guam, of all places. And uh, that was really the cover story for the uh, Iran rescue mission. So uh, the very first thing we did uh, as Hurlburt got under uh, essentially planning cell, that the gunships were sent to Guam to train for long range infiltration. Uh, and it was kind of an unusual thing, but uh, I'll get on to my mission next after the next question. Yeah, absolutely. We chatted about, you talked about AC-130s and I did not know there was any AC-130s involved in that Operation Eagle Claw. Yeah, uh, that's true. And uh, operational security was very tight. Like I say, uh, there was people on that mission that didn't know they were on that mission. That's, you can't get tighter security than that. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Colonel Dick Dunwoody was the, uh, the wing commander at the time. And there was only about four people on the entire base of Hurlburt that knew what we were actually training for. And believe it or not, while the MC-130s were training for the actual rescue with the Delta Force, and the Ranger Force, gunships were actually not part of the rescue mission. And I, I've detailed this out real well in, in the books that I've uh, written, uh, but you can get the details there. But the, the general, general consensus was we were training for a strike on the Abadan oil refinery in Iran. It was a punitive strike. Completely different. Why were gunships selected? Because we could shoot at night with limited collateral damage and we had the legs to get in there. That's the, the main reason. Uh, then that mission, I guess somebody figured out that we were gonna probably light it on fire, said, no, nah, that's not such a good idea. Let's move them over to Katami Air Base and shoot the F-14s out there. And not until after Thanksgiving that year did we get moved to the actual rescue itself. And we were then assigned to. Now, mind you, uh, I was a three-striper at the time. If people remember the old Buck Sergeant rank, that's what it was back then. And I had no idea what we were training for. Everybody kind of thought they knew, but uh, you weren't allowed to speculate or you were coming off. 
And I tell you, uh, that was the only thing in town that day or that time. So nobody wanted to come off. Everybody kept their, their mouth shut. Uh, we were moved to the uh, rescue mission for fire support uh, towards the end, right after Thanksgiving in 79. So, you know, the, the perception is that there's only six C-130s, eight helicopters, and about 120 Delta Force assaulters. I think that was not incorrect, or incorrect, rather. Uh, yeah, like, like I said earlier, I think our OPSEC was really good because yeah. there was over a thousand people, and I've got the list of all the names. We got them from the non-disclosure agreements, as a matter of fact, that a uh, thousand people involved in that mission, and like I said, a lot of them didn't even know, especially the support people over at Wadi Kina in Egypt, didn't even know they were on the mission until after the, uh, the abort. The mission was actually two nights. We hear about the six C-130s and the uh, eight helicopters on, on night one. Unfortunately, the crash at uh, Desert One resulted in the loss of eight lives, five of our own, and, uh, and three Marines. At, at that point, uh, night two never happened. And then, and then, which was very sad, certainly, but wasn't there plans to have a second rescue mission? Uh, yes, there was. Uh, and. We actually, when we came back here to the States, uh, almost within about a week or two, we inherited all the 53s, all the, uh, both the MA, or I mean the, the MH-53s, which were pretty much new at the time, and also uh, the HHs. And uh, prior to that, we only had three H-3s and three Hueys, so we didn't really have much helicopter force out of Hurlburt. Uh, we called it Operation Honey Badger. We went out there to uh, the east or the west coast out at, at uh, uh, White Sands Missile Range, and that's where we trained Army uh, Helicopter Force, Air Force Helicopter Force, gunships, and Talons. And pretty much throughout the rule book for everything, says you guys invent these new tactics because it's something that we had never done before. Uh, we did wind up losing 153 in that whole uh, exercise, but and uh, did what now people would call very uh, risky things. Uh, some might say stupid. Uh, we didn't see it that way. We were trying to our best to develop uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures to pull the mission off. Unfortunately, uh, the mission didn't really go forward. Uh, we even, oh yeah, I need to mention too, there's at least one guy in here I know in part of Project Credible Sport, which is another attempt at uh, developing a capacity to fly a fixed wing airplane into Tehran and land in the soccer stadium. It's called Project Credible Sport. And get up there on the internet, it's the one where I had all the rocket motors, the uh, ASROC missile motors on the airplane so they could land in very short. Uh, distances and take off in very short distances. One of those guys is here. I know he's a friend of mine. Uh, I won't name him out, but that was uh, very interesting. That was done right out here on field one at Eglin, the same exact field where the Doolittle Raiders trained back in, uh, in 42. And uh, after a few successful takeoffs and landings, uh, they had a crash, resulted in the loss of the airplane. Unfortunately, uh, they had moved all the hostages into different locations, uh, so it made a, a second rescue attempt impossible anyway. And I do detail all this out in, uh, in, in my second book, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it right there. And, and I'll thank Bill Walter, who's been my personal historian for this. He has written two books, Ghost Riders 1968 and 1975 and then 1976 to 1995. Both are available outside. Really, really great, a great reading, Bill. So I appreciate that. You've been a, a great help in this situation. Speaking of great help, Kirby Locklear is a city of Fort Walton Beach City Council member. And I was having lunch with him about a month ago. And we we're talking about this program. And I said, man, I got to find someone who was at Grenada. And he goes, I was at Grenada. I said, holy cow. So I had no idea. So Kirby, would you be kind enough, my friend, to tell us what it was like for Operation Urgent Fury on the island of Grenada? Um, my story began on a Sunday morning on the uh, October 23rd, 1983. My crew was over at Charleston Air Force Base. We were bringing back a, a gunship, but it was there we heard the news break that two truck bombs had uh, struck buildings in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, housing American and French service members. Uh, it killed over 307 people, including 241 U.S. service members. Most of those were Marines. 
As we were flying back to Hurlburt, and as uh, crews will do, we shared a little bit of the gallows humor. Uh, we said, boys, we are going to Becca Valley, Lebanon, the land of the three fingers of death. Uh, for those who are flyers, that's the SA-6, by the way. Uh, we also added, someone will be meeting us upon landing and saying, you're going into crew rest immediately. Sure enough, when I got there, there was that blue and white staff car. The colonel comes out, talks to the crew, and says, as of this moment, you are in crew rest. Uh, and so off we went home. I took care of some personal business, and I waited until that next day, midday Monday, on the 24th of October, I was ordered report. We entered a large conference room. If you've ever seen a World War II uh, movie and you see the bomber crews coming in and there's a big screen covering the map, that's exactly what we walked into. The colonel pulled the uh, drape away and I was fully expecting to see a map of Lebanon. And I saw an island. And I looked at the navigator next to me and I said, where the hell is that? <laughs> so. The briefers went on to say President Ronald Reagan was, has ordered U.S. forces to invade and secure uh, approximately 1,000 Americans uh, threatened by the newly installed Marxist uh, regime on the island of Grenada. As a member of the 16th Special Operations Squadron, Herbert Field, I was assigned to an AC-130 call sign Lima 56 in support of Operation Urgent Fury. Our mission was to be the first over the island to determine if the Point Salinas International Airport was uh, cleared or blocked so that we could determine whether they were going to do an air land assault or whether they were going to do a parachute assault. Uh, we, are, we arrived at approximately 3 o'clock in the morning and it was a couple hours before sunrise and sure enough that runway was blocked. They knew we were coming. The Airborne Assault was led by the 75th uh, Rangers, followed by the 82nd Airborne. The northern half of the island was the responsibility of the U.S. Navy and Marines. Once the second gunship arrived, and that was Lima 58, we went to our secondary mission to support, uh, the, um, to secure personnel east of the airport. While over the secondary objective, dawn broke and we could see Lima 58 engaging AAA anti-aircraft guns uh, and the airborne assault was under its way. Then Lima 58 experienced a 105 gun malfunction and we joined the fight over Salinas, engaged the Cuban man AAA sites. During the initial uh, run-in, the lead MC-130 Talon from the 8th SOS was spotlighted and drew heavy AAA fire, but they was pretty much already locked up so they were able to succeed, uh, do a successful drop of the Rangers. But the second and third combat talents had to abort their run-in due to heavy fire. Unfortunately, the shooters were on planes two and three. The first airplane dropped the command and control and the support elements. I could hear on the radios as those uh, command elements were calling, where are our shooters? Unfortunately, well fortunately, the gunships were able to provide cover and suppress the AAA to allow the airdrop to continue. Eventually, we ran low on fuel and a KC-1 tanker called in the clear, anyone need gas? We took up the opportunity, refueled, and got back into the fight. There we engaged targets at Fort Rupert and we supported a Navy SEAL team pinned down by hostile fire at the governor's mansion. Finally, we ran out of ammo and low on fuel, we were ordered to go to Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico to take home more ammo because the operation was definitely taking longer than anyone expected. We would brief, it was going to be 24 hours. It really lasted longer than that. But when we landed at Roosevelt Roads, the ammo was no good and we had to go back to Barbados, refuel, rearm. By this time, more gunships and supplies were on its way to Barbados. When we landed at Barbados, I fully expected to get back into the fight, but we had a crew replaced us and I was able to put an end to my 30 hour crew day with over 20 hours in the air. By midday Wednesday, we launched again out of Barbados and we supported targets near the student campus and the police training area. Interesting, while weapons hot, a Navy A7 flew low right through our flying orbit. 
I always wondered if that A7 pilot knew he was in our no, crosshairs. He's, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> Near the end of our time on station, another AAA site uh, came up, but uh, we returned fire. And it was there where I saw the uh, CH-46 that became disabled and was abandoned on the beach. For myself and the crew of Lima 5-6, that was pretty much the end of our, uh, our fighting though the five gunships continued to engage targets throughout the third day. From there on, we flew armed reconnaissance missions until Agent uh, Operations Urgent Fury officially ended on the 4th of November when we went home. It's important to note though, that although Operation Urgent Fury was a small campaign and often looked, at least we never forget the bravery and the gallantry and the sacrifice of the 19 U.S. service members that lost their lives in those three days. Thank you, Kirby. You know, I, I remember when you were chatting about the Grenada map. Do we have a picture of that map, Seth? When we were having lunch, you said they didn't, they didn't know where Grenada was. They had to give you a tourist map to find out, right? Isn't that what they issued you? You know, I get asked that question quite a bit, and when we were doing some research, I actually have a copy of the actual tourist map we used, uh, and if you look at it, the runway wasn't even on there. Uh, we had the navigational charts to get us there, but the detail we needed to do targets was uh, pretty limiting, and this is all we had. You know, it is uh, certainly sad, and we lost the 19 servicemen, but the, the, the Grenadian citizens, what did they say about the operation? I mean, they, they were happy you were there? They were very happy, and, and I believe that we're reading my friend's book here. They talk about, they even put a, a memorial to remember the, the sacrifice of those 19 service members. Yeah, that is correct, and they also October 25th of every year is a day of Thanksgiving, a national day of Thanksgiving in Grenada. There we they have, have no so turkeys, though. Thank you, uh, Kirby, for that. I appreciate that immensely. You know, in our script initially going through chronologically, we had Panama next, but we're going to read that in your book if we can. So Panama came next, and then now I want to jump to uh, August of 1991, where Iraqi di dictator Saddam Hussein directed his army to seize the country of Kuwait. Within a month, Herbert aircraft and personnel were in place in Saudi Arabia, ready for combat, but it took until January for all forces to arrive and prepare for the war. It all started on the night of January 17th, 1991, when Lieutenant Colonel Corby Martin led a formation of AH-64 Apache helicopters to take out Iraqi early warning radar sites along the border. In sporting vernacular, Corby, it's fair to say that you kicked off the war. Corby, tell us about it. Thanks, Ted. As you can see, I put my glasses on. Uh, welcome, to the welcome to the community celebration honoring the 75th anniversary of the Air Force. I used to tell people uh, who asked me where I was from that I was from Idaho. Now I tell people that ask me that question that I'm from Florida. I spent over half of my life in this local area. I met my wife here. My children were born here. Uh, in fact, my wife's uh, mother uh, graduated from Choctaw in 1958. So we have a lot of folks in the area, and so this is my home now. Um, how many of you were in the military in 1991? Show of hands. I won't make you stand up like Ted does. So there's a lot of people out there. How many of you were in school, K through 12, in 1991? All right, all right. Next question, how many of you were even born in 1991? <laughs> we got fewer hands than I usually get, so the problem with that is this crowd is I need to make sure I tell the right story, uh, because most of you can call me on everything I say. Um, so I'll try to keep it to the point and truthful. Our mission, Eager Anvil, which was to lead eight AH-64 Apache helicopters from the 1st of the 101st Airborne Division, 18th Airborne Corps, to destroy two armed early warning radar sites in Western Iraq to clear a path for aircraft assigned to bomb Iraqi airfields in Western Iraq. We weren't clearing the way for the airfield for the aircraft to go to downtown Baghdad. We were specifically clearing a path for aircraft heading for H-2 and H-3 uh, in Western Iraq. I was a captain at the 1st Special Operations Wing early in August of 1991 uh, when we left Fort, Fort Walton Beach and deployed to Saudi Arabia for Operation Desert Shield to defend uh, East, uh, Middle Eastern countries from the tyranny of Iraq because they had just invaded Kuwait. I'd like to tell you about the mission that ended Desert Shield and started Desert Storm. On the 14th of January, 1991, we were flight lead for an eight ship of MH-53 helicopters flying to northwest Saudi Arabia to an FOB, the city of Al Juf's airport. It was about a 600-mile uh, transit 
we were on our way to start the war we'd been rehearsing for for six months. A couple of interesting things happened that day. It was the third day in a row of rain in Saudi Arabia. It never rained in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. We were there for six months, and this was the first time it rained. And so uh, it was pouring, and we had uh, we lived in tents, and the uh, ground was hard as a rock, hard as cement, so everything we had was wet. And so um, we had to move all of our stuff on top of our cots in the tents we were in, and then put the other stuff on our helicopters to move to the uh, Ford operating base. Um, in six months, you can become quite a pack rat. And so there was a lot of stuff that we put on our put on our cuff before we left. We flew to the forward offering race at Al Juf, uh, really safely. We pretty, got, pretty much got there as all one big group. We also moved up in status. We got to live in dorm rooms. Before that, like I said, we were in tents. They were Saudi Arabian power line workers that were moved back because of the war coming up. We had heat, AC, individual rooms and showers. We were in absolute heaven rather than living in a tent with seven to 11 guys. The next day, the 15th of January, we flew functional check flights on the aircraft to uh, include uh, checking the power so we could expect maximum power from the 53s when we took off. Uh, we test fired our personal weapons in the desert, and then we went back to our luxurious dorm rooms. On the 16th, uh, we were on the flight line again, uh, pretty much organizing our helicopters, checking all the equipment out, making sure we were ready for the war uh, if it started, which we didn't think it would, and making sure everything was good to go. When Lieutenant Colonel, and now Major General retired, uh, Rich Comer came out and said, H hour is 0300 in the morning, local. So we all took off, went back to our luxurious dorms and get ready for the afternoon briefings, the afternoon briefings. The Apache target time on target was 0238 local in the morning on the 17th of January. That's between six and seven uh, 8 p.m. local here, uh, local time. I told you, the rest of the afternoon we spent uh, getting ready and prepping for the Task Force Normandy mission. 17th of January, 1991, we take off about 1 o'clock in the morning. Mike Kingsley's white flight was first to take off because their IP point was further north than ours, going after those two armed radar sites. Then our red flight took off. The route was eventful. We had a tailwind, uh, had to slow to about 90 miles per hour. Normal cruise was 120 to 125 nautical miles, miles per hour. We had to slow down in order to make our time on target for the Apaches. And we were pretty good at time on target, plus or minus 30 seconds, give or take. We got closer to the border, we saw a lit building. On the border, or in the border area, there's not actually a line on the ground that shares the border, but pretty close to the border area. And so we, avoid, we changed course and avoided, tried to try to avoid that building, flew about five miles to the east. Uh, as we crossed what we thought was the border, they turned the light out. Did they know we were coming? Probably, not for sure. We flew the Apaches to their tactical IP, uh, dropped a chemical light marker so that they could update their navigation and targeting systems, and then released the Apaches to their target, the way they went. So and then we did a big left-hand turn and in route to our holding point, rally point in Saudi Arabia, we were going back south to wait for the Apaches to get their mission done. We were shot at by an anti-aircraft missile. We flew by a tent and a truck in the middle of nowhere as we passed the area, my wingmen fired flares, which were quickly followed by our aircraft firing flares and uh, making a tactical break. Uh, we found out later from Shock 2 that their right scanner and tail scanner saw a guy fire an anti-aircraft missile at us from the truck, possibly an SA-7 based on the, uh, uh, the uh, characteristics, characteristics of the missile. He didn't hit us. Uh, we were low level, and the flares went off and, and misdirected the uh, missile, we think. We were so focused on the Apache mission that we didn't consider going back and taking care of the guy. As far as I know, he could have been in Saudi Arabia or he could have been in Iraq. Not sure about that. So we just kept going, pressing on down the road to our rejoined holding point for the Apaches. While we were holding for the Apaches, I told the crew to watch north of our holding area for the start of the fireworks. And about 2.38 in the morning, it looked like the 4th of July was going off because there were other targets being hit around the area besides our Apaches. The Apaches started it, and then there were multiple targets being hit. Um, you could see AAA going up in the air, uh, trying to get to the airplanes that were trying to bomb. Big flashes on the ground, uh, 10, 15 miles north of us, where the bombs were hitting. And at, obviously, at that same time, there were T-LAMs in the air. There were cruise missiles in the air. There were uh, F-117s dropping bombs downtown Baghdad. All kinds of things happened. It took about five to 10 minutes for all that kind of calmed down. We viewed F-15Es, F-111s, and tornadoes 
they were flying about 500 feet in our forward-looking infrared radar, and they were heading to the uh, west to bomb those airfields that the uh, H-2 and H-3 that the, through the corridor that the Apaches had opened up on them. After we rejoined our Apaches and took them to an airfield for refueling, we climbed up uh, to uh, air refuel ourselves and get ready to follow on the mission of combat search and rescue. We were redirected to Al Juf because of the small number of aircraft that were shot down on the opening night of Desert Storm. I believe it was probably one, uh, and it would be Commander Spiker in the Navy F-18. Uh, that's the only one that got shot down that night. Um, as we were heading up to our tanker, uh, it looked like well, here, oh, the sky was covered, and it was blanketed with anti-collision lights. It looked like the LA freeway in the in the nighttime. All these lights, all these little lights, of, um, fighter bomber flights chasing this big light in front of them to try to get gas. Everybody wanted gas before they crossed the line to head into Iraq and drop bombs or provide cap for the people that were dropping bombs. And so you'd have these a bunch of little lights flickering around right behind a big light, and they would drop off and they would fly north. And at a certain latitude the lights were off and it was completely dark. Dark as you can believe out in the desert at night. So it was really black and you could not see those guys going through. It was an awesome display of air power from the United States of America and our coalition partners. Something you would never ever see in the rest of your life. Uh, today you have some of those aircraft in the Eglin Herbert Air Parks. They symbolize the sacrifices that were made by all the Air Force heroes that have come before you. It's a daily reminder of the dedication and belief you all have in the Air Force mission and the United States of America. Thanks. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Martins. Uh, what followed his mission was the largest air campaign since World War II. Both Herbert and Eglin were there. MC-130E from Herbert dropped 15,000 pound Blue 82 bombs during Desert Storm and five AC-130 gunships flew strike missions into Kuwait and Iraq. Tragically, AC-130H gunship call sign Spirit 03 was shot down during the Battle of Kafi with loss of 14 crewmen. The 33rd Tactical Fighter Wing from Eglin shot down more Iraqi MiGs than any other unit, earning it the nickname of MiG Killer. And during that time, the 32nd 46th Test Wing conducted and developed the Bunker Buster, which was delivered and dropped on a hardened facility during Desert Storm. So it's hard to consolidate an entire couple of years of war into that amount of time, but we're going to move on. In this case, we're going to skip over Somalia. You're going to pick out that book for, uh, you're going to pick out that book of bills out in the lobby, and we're going to go directly to. In October 2001, Herbert AC-130 gunships were the first to strike Taliban targets in Afghanistan. One of the navigators on during the initial missions is here with us today. Then a lieutenant, Colonel Black, served her crew well and was responsible for all communications between the gunship and friendly ground forces. While it's true there were many female crew members on aircraft in 2001, when her voice was transmitted to a ground controller supporting the Afghan National Alliance, an Afghan general named her the Angel of Death. Though she does not like the name, and it's not even close to her personality, it certainly seems to have stuck. So, Colonel Black, we're so honored to have you here today. Please tell us the real story. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm just grateful to be able to serve my Air Force. I am proud to be a member of AFSOC and humbled to be able to sit on the stage and in a room full of some incredible heroes. So, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to tell a story about there I was. Uh, it was uh, 2001, and we were part. I was part of the 16th Special Operations Squadron, the AC-130H Spectre gunship. We uh, we arrived with three airplanes and four crews. And when we arrived uh, one evening in Karshi County, about Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan, a country to the north, a staff car didn't greet us, but our commander did, and did put us in crew rest. So not much has changed. 18 hours later, we found ourselves overhead our target. But prior to getting there, we were rushed, pushed into our ops tent and given our mission briefing. We were given a call sign, we were given a frequency, and a location in grid. The chaplain prayed for warmth because we were an unpressurized aircraft. He prayed for lots of targets, and he prayed for safety. Our lawyer, our JAG, came in and said, don't kill women and children, don't shoot mosques, and we'll sort the rest out later. The mission preparation was a cardboard box full of charts that we were supposed to sort through to figure out how to get to the objective area. 
So as a navigator, as mentioned, I'm responsible for getting the, the crew from point A to point B, but also the tactical communications. So as the pilots were starting the aircraft, starting the engines, I had the chart out figuring out how we were going to get from Uzbekistan to Afghanistan, find an area to sight in our weapons or tweak the guns, and then get to the objective. And we did just that. About 30 minute flight down south, found some sand dunes, at least that's what it said on the chart, sighted in our weapons, and proceeded off to the east in the, in the vicinity of Kanduz. And that's where we were in contact with ODA 595, otherwise known as the Horse Soldiers, more importantly, U.S. Air Force Combat Controller Bart Decker. So when I was able to speak with him on the radio to get the situation report, he painted the, he painted the scene. And he told us to start hunting for armor. You see, in Afghanistan in 2001, the country was dark. And if anybody was out moving at night, they were up to no good. So we were searching in the vicinity of Kanduz with those that had flown in the days of Panama and me on my first combat mission, having just landed less than 24 hours prior. We did find some multiple launch rocket systems. We found some armored vehicles and were able to destroy them. And while we were engaging those targets, Bart Decker pops up on the radio and asks us to put eyes on a vehicle moving towards their direction. You know, the first job in the gunship community is to identify the friendlies, and we had done that when we moved into the area. So we identified where our friendlies were at, went back to that vehicle who had lights on driving down a road. They essentially cleared us to engage, and as we were going through the motions inside our aircraft to engage that vehicle, it pulled into a complex in the middle of nowhere. And at that building were multiple vehicles and multiple adult males. I, I relayed on the radio what we were seeing as a part of my job. And during that time, this ODA team and, and, uh, and Bart Decker were co-located with General Dostum and the Northern Alliance, those that you've seen in pictures riding on horseback through northern Afghanistan. He could not believe that he was hearing a woman on the radio, and in fact asked our teammates, is that, is that a woman? In which they replied, as a matter of fact, it is. We continued our mission as we were, as I was painting the picture of all the, uh, the movement around the, the objective building, or the new objective building, we heard standby, and then we heard, those who confirmed Taliban, you're cleared hot. First combat mission, I look over at the crusty Lieutenant Colonel, Fire Control Officer Michael Radford sitting next to me, I went, this is combat. So I was pretty darn excited to, uh, to really deliver some payback to the enemy who had wreaked havoc on our land on September 11th. So we proceeded to prosecute the enemy. Uh, we engaged a vehicle that was parked right outside the building, and dozens upon dozens of adult males poured out of it. We ended up shooting 400 rounds of 40 and 100 rounds of 105 that had been floor loaded inside the aircraft. But during that time, and as we were trying to utilize every round and make it count, we were using the ISLID, which is a, under night vision goggles, is a high powered laser pointer for us, for our sorting and tracking purposes. Well, during that portion of our mission, then General Dostum had access to the night vision devices from our team and, and looked at it and looked at the team and asked if it was a death ray. So the team members looked at each other and said, as a matter of fact, it is. It is a death ray. And he, so as this story is evolving, he's, America is so determined they bring their women to kill Taliban. And he knew, he had been certain that America had developed a death ray. And it was on board Spectre gunship that night. As I'm again relaying what's unfolding in front of us inside our, our, our sensors, General Dostum gets on his walkie-talkie and calls the enemy that we're engaging and says, in so many words, you're so pathetic, you need to surrender now, American women are killing you, in fact, the angel of death is raining death and destruction, <laughs> surrender now. As a gunship member on the, on, on the airplane, we have no idea this is happening. We continue to execute our mission. We run out of ammunition. We're bingo fuel, so just enough gas to get back to base. We depart as the next AC-130 is coming on station. For us, it was an opportunity to remove hundreds of enemy from the battlefield and protect our eagles, uh, and they, they got to continue their mission. It wasn't until weeks later that that ODA team had come back up to K2 in, in uh, Karshi Kanabad and told us the story of what had unfolded. 
and they handed me an AK-47 from General Dostum because that next morning after that first mission, hundreds of them absolutely did surrender because of the, uh, of the ability of the AC-130 and its crew members to rain, to rain some hate from above. That, that, uh, that, that AK-47 is now proudly hung in the 16th Special Operations Squadron at Cannon Air Force Base uh, and, and a proud part of their story. You know, and, that, and that's uh, the ability to disgrace and kind of poke at the enemy. I had no idea that that was an effect of being a part of an incredible crew. Uh, but the story doesn't stop there. In the weeks to follow, General Dostum took the idea, the, the, the premise that America allows their women to go into combat, and he used it as a burqa, at a burqa unveiling ceremony for young Afghan girls and women, and said, if you continue to fight for your freedoms, you will one day have the freedoms that America offers for their young girls. So again, just trying to do my part as a crew member, a, a, part, an, a part of an incredible crew, having no idea the second and third order effects we were able to have on so many lives. Proud to have been a part of it. Humbled to share my little piece of AFSOC history with all of you. Thank you. Colonel and Allison Black, thank you. I want to come back to Afghanistan in just a second before we get to our, le our last uh, presenter, but I want to jump over to Moab. But we'd be remiss if I didn't drop Moab somewhere into this, Bill, 2002. <laughs> so, Bill, rather than me doing it, will you kind of give me an overview of your take on Moab? Sure, I'll, yeah, I'll give you a quick snippet. Uh, Eglin, of course, uh, built the Moab right here. It was an internal project. And yeah, when we first named it, it was the mother of all bombs. That's no mystery there. And we had to back into the other name. I was actually in, in weapons and tactics superintendent side, led the project for AFSOC. And the one last thing I'd like to say about Moab is people always ask me, why is it such bright green and yellow? And the interesting story behind that is when they filled the bombs out in McAllister, Oklahoma, nobody had enough green and yellow paint to paint them. That's standard bomb colors. So they went downtown to the local John Deere dealer and bought <laughs> as much green and yellow paint as they could. And that's why the first, and do we have the picture of the, yeah, the first bomb, that's actually me on the left, uh, on your left. I believe, uh, in the BDUs, and that's Al Wiemorts that uh, actually was a program engineer, and Bruce Patterson and uh, Captain Drab. That's the first live bomb. So the interesting part is um, it was painted with uh, as a harvester color, and I guess you could say it is. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Moab. I want to go back this past Sunday, my friends, was the 21st anniversary commemoration of September 11th. And as a little history, as early as 1998, Osama bin Laden verbally declared war on America, but became frustrated when America failed to respond. National command authorities did not take bin Laden seriously, of course, until September 11th, 2001, which awoke a sleeping giant. As a result, a joint special operations task force composed of U.S. Army, Air Force, and Afghan Northern Alliance fighters was formed and assigned the name Task Force Dagger. We heard a little bit about Colonel Black's story on that, but I want to share another side here of the ODA 595. On October 19, 2001, U.S. Army Special Forces ODA 595 arrived in Afghanistan. This team, composed of 12 U.S. Army Green Berets, two Air Force Special Tactics Airmen, and National Alliance fighters, were the first ground forces to retaliate against bin Laden's Taliban allies. Years later, ODA 595 was immortalized in the book Horse Soldiers and the movie 12 Strong. Today, this small team shares a spot in history that parallel our Doolittle Raiders, who were the first Americans to retaliate against Japan after Pearl Harbor. In an effort, as we do at the Chamber of Commerce, to help honor great Americans on October 22nd of this year, 2022, our Fort Beach community will be honoring all mission participants of Task Force Dagger, but especially ODA 595, and the Special Tactics Airmen who were attached to ODA 595. All 11 of the surviving ODA 595 soldiers will be here attending our banquet, as well as you invited several of the Air Commandos of Task Force Dagger. So uh, October 22nd, 2022, right here, carrying on that tradition that was shared with Colonel Black earlier from the uh, horse soldier. So mark that down on your calendar. 
To round it out here today on a, an incredibly high note, on May 2, 2011, Lieutenant General Marshall Brad Webb, then a Brigadier General, was Assistant Commanding General, Headquarters Joint Special Operations Command, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, during Operation Neptune Spear, also known as the killing of bin Laden. As historical snapshots in time go, this picture is right up there and ingrained in the American psyche today. We're fortunate to have Lieutenant General Webb with us today, and I truly am anxious to hear your story. General Webb. Thank you, Ted. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll get to the little kind of the behind the scenes of this picture in a second, but first, uh, congratulations. I'm the number nine batter in the lineup. You've made it. Well done. And happy birthday to the Air Force. You know, in a couple days here, the Air Force celebrates 75 years, 75 years young. And I think the takeaway ought to be from this crowd, whether you're military or you're supporters of the military in the Northwest Florida region, that while our Air Force celebrates all that has been accomplished uh, via air power, American air power in 75 years, look how much, so much of it has come in the form right here uh, in Northwest Florida. That ought not be lost on you. And frankly, the nine vignettes or so that we've had doesn't even scratch the surface of what happens here. Obviously, you've heard the stories of tons of combat, uh, tons of combat training, combat preparation. There's a humanitarian side that was uh, brushed uh, by briefly with respect to Vietnamese uh, refugees, up to and including uh, hurricanes both here and, and uh, close to here that we needed to respond to in the Afghan uh, evacuee uh, instance of about a year ago. Uh, and certainly for the last uh, several decades, the counterterrorism fight has had at its roots soft air power uh, that has been resident here in Northwest Florida. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the importance of our uh, front of the line uh, fifth generation fighter, uh, I just recently retired from AETC and had under my command the 33rd Fighter Wing, uh, with, as the, as the uh, threat evolves to uh, great power competition, especially with respect to China, uh, the importance uh, uh, remains in this whole Northwest Florida region. The picture that you see behind me, uh, yes, it's iconic, and I'm going to tell you a couple of stories real quick about it. But what I think this really represents, it's really kind of poetic, uh, because it's an Air Force member in Air Force uniform in the Situation Room, uh, and frankly, it made some people scratch their heads going, hey, this was Navy SEALs, right? And listen, there is airmen and air commandos deeply embedded behind this mission, all resident of this area, having grown up here or having trained here or being prepared here, and in fact, uh, in the days after this, General uh, Schwartz, who was then the Chief Staff of the Air Force, most of you all know him very well, uh, called me to his office. I was still in Washington. He gave me a big old bear hug. And I was like, what, what gives, sir? And his, his point was, thank you for wearing your Air Force uniform uh, in there. Uh, and so it shouldn't be lost on you. Uh, and, you know, while a lot of the contributions may be kind of behind the scenes from an air soft uh, perspective, it ought not be lost. Uh, the, the importance of this region and the preparation that we do for combat. Okay, so for this picture, I get asked really three questions uh, really, really routinely. And that is, why are you so overdressed compared to everybody else in that picture? What are you doing sitting in the president's chair? And what are you doing changing your Facebook status in the middle of the operation? And it's usually in that order. So really briefly, uh, I, I would just say that, um, uh, and I'm going to cut to the quick because this could be an hour-long discussion, and I know you guys are really ready for it, but let me just boil it down. The night before the mission happened, I had called uh, the chairman, who you can see uh, over my shoulder, or uh, he's standing over my shoulder, called his exec and said, hey, what does the chairman wear? And said, oh, the chairman always wears service dress. Never, I know it's Sunday. No, no, uh, always service dress. And uh, you can see the only other uniformed person in that picture. You can tell what he's wearing. So I kind of got stuck in the monkey suit there for the, uh, for the duration of the day. The second question, um, and this, I'll boil this down to its essence. The Situation Room isn't a room. It's, a, it's office space with several uh, conference rooms in it. There's a big conference room 
uh, where all the principals were going to be, and they had said, hey, General Webb, you know, we understand, in, you know, in your mind you're probably important, but you're going to be over here in this little broom closet, and if we have a question, we'll come get you. And, and so I said, okay, that's fine. And uh, so I had set up my gear. Uh, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the blurry head in the bottom left of the picture is my uh, radio control uh, NCO, uh, Rob Launders. Uh, and he would kill me if he didn't say, point out, and every time you tell the story, that's my head in the back of that picture. Says, and, uh, and so he and I set up in that room to be ready to, you know, have the awareness to give the president whoever needed the information, information they needed. And so because everybody was in the other room across the hall, the big one, I sat at the end of the table so I could obviously be close to the door and uh, be responsive if somebody called for me. But it's completely obvious what was going to happen because... I had all the information. Uh, and so over time, it kind of flooded in. It started with uh, then Vice President Biden and then Secretary of State Clinton. And, uh, and then at some point, um, you know, everybody was in the room, uh, up to and including at H hour as the helicopters approached the, uh, uh, the site, uh, President Obama came in the room. And to my credit, and it's on NBC's website, you can find him interview. He says, and because that's true, and I get questioned about this, I stood up to give him my chair, okay? And he kind of maneuvered behind me, pushed on my shoulders and put me down, and he said, no, no, you got this. I'm going to stand over here or sit over in the corner. And there really wasn't a whole lot of time to have a just argument about it, so I was like, whatever, and sat back down and started doing my job. So, the, by the way, the White House hates me for this because uh, that picture, you know, uh, they hate that. Uh, I actually got an opportunity to do another, uh, we had another mission about six months later, uh, a different one, just could be Cannon mission, you may recall, uh, where that same kind of thing happened, and I made sure, I, dang sure I wasn't sitting in that chair. <laughs> and, of course, the last thing is about the, fa of course, I wasn't doing uh, Facebook, I was actually uh, doing some, uh, um, uh, what we call Merc chat or internet chat with, uh, with our teams that were forward, who actually didn't know I was in the White House, because when they had left, I was supposed to be at the command center at uh, Fort Bragg, and uh, and really, I was just getting kind of updates on uh, on uh, what was happening uh, to relay to the team. I don't know uh, when that picture was taken. I'm not sure. Um, there was. Uh, I don't know why Hillary Clinton is yawning or you know whatever it is that she happens to be doing there at the moment. Um, the one story that I will do, will pass on, uh, and and then I'll I'll kind of let it rest because uh, a little humorous. Um, we got to the uh, site. Uh, we were you know, obviously the president sat down, there was some commotion, clearly the mission wasn't going particularly as planned, and uh, he asked me the question, I knew in my mind, just keep talking, don't say Desert One, don't say Black Hawk Down, but just keep talking to him about what's going on, and I'm explaining what he's seeing, and, and uh, he goes, okay, so how long are we supposed to be on the ground? I said, well, Mr. President, uh, we're supposed to be on the ground for 30 minutes, obviously we've had some, a couple complications, but the mission's continuing, everything's fine, he's like, all right. How long have we been on the ground? I said, Mr. President, we've been on the ground four minutes. So some time goes by. He said, how long have we been on the ground now? I said, well, Mr. President, we've been on the ground seven minutes. He said, I'm never going to make it to 30. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, folks, that uh, it, was a, it was a surreal moment, uh, but it was a really, really proud day. You can be proud of your nation's leadership because they were focused on the execution of the mission without being intervening uh, into the plan. Uh, I'm honored to have been a part of that, and I guess I've made peace with the fact that I was, a, I was once an uh, Air Commando warrior like the rest of you, but I'll be known as the uh, combat clerk uh, throughout all time. Um, folks here uh, in the Northwest Florida region, um, thank you for your support uh, to our, uh, your airmen, America's airmen. Uh, if you can take any lessons uh, from this picture, if it was representative of anything, it is uh, that ethos of there is a way, we find it, and be prepared because these air commandos, these airmen, uh, their number is going to be called one of these times to execute. You just heard nine examples here on the stage. Uh, and don't be found wanting when your moment comes because it's going to come. Okay? And for you all that support in the Northwest Florida region, Thank you. I've been stationed in enough places in, uh, in my career to know that the support that we receive from this community is second to none. And so, Ted, thanks for hosting us today, and happy birthday. Thank you. Well done, General.
We're going to now release uh, panel one to go back. I have a special presentation coming up in just one second. So I want to thank Chief Master Sergeant Bill Walter, Lieutenant Kirby, Lieutenant Colonel Kirby Locklear, Lieutenant Colonel Corby Martin, Colonel Allison Black, and Lieutenant General Marshal Brad Webb. Dale Dye, what did you learn today about the Air Force you didn't know prior to this, sir, as a dedicated Marine? They, they fly airplanes and stuff. I, I've, I've, I've met some great folks, and uh, it makes me feel, uh, you know, we always say the Marine Corps is uh, a small family. Uh, it's clear to me from the ethos and the support that I've seen here in Northwest Florida for, for our, our United States Air Force <clears throat> that the same applies. And that's, that's, it should make you feel good. It certainly should. It makes me feel good. Thank you, Dale. We're so honored to have you here, folks. We could not be here at Maddie Kelly Arts Center, Northwest Florida State College, without an incredible performance by our good friends, the voices of Northwest Florida. Come on out, my friends. There they are. The voices of Northwest Florida State.
graduates of Northwest Florida State College. So honored, folks. You know we're at an Air Force function. You can't leave with what, one more song. So I want you to stay tuned. However, I do want to tell you that this includes our formal presentation. I want to thank all the panel members who were here who agreed to share their stories. They'll all be in the lobby afterwards, including Dale Dye and Bill Walter, who have some books for you to purchase, a great souvenir coming up here today. I want to thank our good friends from the Boeing Company, Eglin Federal Credit Union, and Northwest Florida State College for their support. Most of all, our community would like to pass along a big heartfelt thank you to past, present, and future members of the U.S. Air Force. And I know that as a member of the Air Force, you are obligated to sing this song and sing every single word, General Life, all four verses of the new version. <laughs> and if you don't know the words, they'll be right there. Back to the voices of Northwest Florida State College. Here we go, the Air Force song. We go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sun. Here they come, zooming to meet our thunder. Adam, now give them the gun. Down we dive, spouting our flame from under. Off with one hell of a roar. We live in fame, we'll go down in flame. Hey, nothing will stop the USA. Brilliant minds flashing a crane of thunder, sent it high into the blue. Valiant hands blasted the world asunder. How they lived, God only knew, God only knew. Found the soul, the soul streaming up skies to conquer. Gave us wings ever to soar. We skies before and bore and bore. Nothing will stop the U.S. Here's a toast to the halls of those who love the vastness of the sky. To a friend we send a message of the brave who serve on high. We drink to those who gave their all the gold. Then down we roar to score the rainbow pot of gold. A toast to the halls of those we boast. The USA. If you live to be a gray-haired wonder, keep the nose out of the blue. Fight to fight, guarding our nation's border, we'll be there, followed by more. In echelon, we carry on, oh, nothing will stop the Air Force. State College, my friends, happy anniversary, happy 75th anniversary to U.S. Air Force. Stop by out there and see Dale Dye and Bill Walter and all the gang out there. Thank you so much for coming.